Fishing in DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their order to Catoctin Creek Rods. They'll also gain access to our private Facebook group community, be entered into weekly prize giveaways, members-only content, and so much more. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. We are almost done with September, and September dog days just mean one thing. It means BFL regionals, probably all at Kerr Reservoir, if we're not mistaken. But sometimes we have some other major major super tournaments, and this one happened to be on the James River, the Tidal River. Uh, this was the inaugural, and I will get this whole title right, so I wrote it down, Hopewell River and Rhodes Festival Bass Fishing Tournament, Electric Boogaloo, on the James River. It had over a $10,000 guaranteed cash prize. We had a, a lot of great competitors in this. I believe it's SB Fishing also participated in this, but... We have the winners on tonight. These two hammers, uh, one of them has been on the show a couple of times. Both of them fish with the Elite 70s and the Alpha Elite Core. It's basically the whole thing Mr. Camp puts on the, the pairs competition and also the, the individuals. Without further ado, let's bring these guys on. We have Chaz and we have Jared. Guys, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Yeah, man. Happy to be here again. So, all right, let's get this out of the way. How did you guys meet? Man. Well, you know, no. Um, actually, through we used to be on Hooker's Bait and Tackle Pro Staff together. That's really how we like officially met, I believe. Yeah, so that was back ago. in 2017, 2018. Back mm-hmm. when they were still around, they used to be right next to ProTech up in Williamsburg, Toano area. Hooker's Bait and Tackle? Yeah, yeah that's was a great right name. I mean, <laughs> R.I.P. That place was legendary. Used to go there. That place was legendary for sure. Yes. Um, but yeah, we met through that and then ended up fishing together in a lot of local John boat stuff, like the stuff I told you about before Thomas that I fished down here. I don't know, is that better or not? If you can see me or not. Yeah, you look great. Um, yeah. The lighting's perfect. In the, the Toyota suites. Um, but yeah, we've been fishing together for a long time now, doing the John boat thing and then kind of progressed into the glass boat team series and all that stuff. When we have time to get Jared has multiple partners. <laughs> <laughs> now the yeah, best, the best couples a, allow for swinging. Yeah, I have a river partner, and then uh, one of my best friends I fish with when I can for sure. So yeah, how long did you guys do the uh, the aluminum boat thing for? We still do it. Oh, we, we do. do. Okay, yeah, not as much as we used to, but yeah. I mean, for many years, um, like you said, since like 2017, 2018, probably like we've been. Fishing pre- we were fishing pretty regular in, in the Suffolk Lakes for a long yeah. time. Um, Jared, Jared, what is your opinion? I, I, I had, uh, again, guys, if you want to, I'll link in the episode description the two episodes we had on with Chaz, and we talked about the electric motor-only tournaments down there. But, like, what was your experience with that? Was that kind of how you cut your teeth as well into tournament fishing? No, not at all. Uh, completely different route. So I went to school at Chowan University down in Carolina, which is, like, 15 minutes from the Nottaway. So oh, my wow. first few tournaments, my dad would drive from Hampton, Virginia to the Nottaway, and I'd meet him there and we'd fish there in the show on. So that was really my first dabble, and I had we had no idea what we were doing. Now, I grew up fishing out of a job <laughs> boat, um, but on the Chickahominy River, fish Chickahominy, Little Creek, stuff like that. So that's really – now, Chaz grew up fishing a lot of John boat stuff, like that's – he spent many a days out there in them Suffolk Lakes in a John boat. Um, but I had kind of the complete upbringing, especially when it comes to tournament fishing, for sure. Yeah, it's just I'm always fascinated by all those lakes down there, too. And then, again, guys, eventually I'm going to get some of those tournament directors on. It's on the to-do list to talk about a lot of those lakes because it's fascinating how many different bodies of water we just don't go to anymore. And it, and it really is a shame. And part of it is the size of the lakes and part of it. And I'm hoping as these, these smaller tournament organizations get more love as the bigger ones just 
do stupid things uh, <laughs> and lose more membership. Like some of these other places will get some love, but that's for another show. This show, I really want to kind of weave the story of really you guys as tournament partners, your seasons right now with the alpha and then also the teams, because that kind of, I think, builds really into this tournament that you guys had here. So, I, I mean, uh, Chaz, I've, I've gotten your take on your season. So, uh, yeah, that's been good. It's been Jared, good for sure. <laughs> I mean, wh Jared, what do you think about it? Um, so, as far as my season has gone, I've had a pretty good year myself. Um, outside of Chaz and I, we've had another okay elite series. Yeah. I think we finished maybe six in points, which, that's you know, against good. that. Yeah, against that group of guys, you're like, man, that's pretty good, but that's not where we want to be. You mm -hmm. know, we were, uh, we went into the last event last year tied for the AOI lead and blew it on the James, which <laughs> always happens to us. We always yeah. blow it on the James. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I had a pretty good alpha year myself. Um, I came in third in the second tournament on the James. So really close to winning that. That would have been really cool to go back to back as partners. That would have been awesome. Yeah. Um, I've had I've had some success this year in the cat trail. Um, I came in third the other week. I came in fourth in another tournament this year, and then I just had one this past weekend. Came in second on the river, um, and I've I've won you know I've won a tournament on the monkey this year and, and some other places. So I, I've had a pretty successful year myself as well. Not quite to what Chaz has because that Alpha Series, that's a big payday. So, But, yeah, I, I'm, I've had a blessed year myself as well. I got to spend the last – I got to spend the weekend fishing the rap, Tidal Rappahannock for the first time for uh, my MVKVA event. And I really, driving up the road, came to this thought that, like, all tidal rivers aren't created equal. But the big social media bass master and all this place would be like, well, it's a tidal body water. Therefore, this person has this experience. And like I said, earlier, like, I, I feel like now I don't think it's true because I think the Potomac is very unique because of its tidal ebbs and flows, the grass things compared to the Poe Monkey, the James, and the Rap. Is, would you agree with that or do you think they do all fish kind of like the same? I'll just throw this out there. I hate the Potomac, so I don't think they fish the same at all. <laughs> it's growing no, on me, but yeah, it's not my favorite either. It, it's very different. I, I mean, not to cut you off here, but I, I don't think they're the same at all. Like, no, no. It, it's um, and you know, I have, you know, like I said, I've been fishing the chicken hominy since I was a kid, and, and it's just, it would blow your mind what it looked like thirty years ago. Really? Oh, lily pads all the way to the Route Five Bridge. You know, it was, it looks so different. It, it's crazy how everything changes from year to year. And that's everywhere. Potomac does the same, you know, the mm. grass flats change and stuff. So no, yes, it helps because you can understand current a little bit better, ebb and flow. You can kind of see where fish set up, but it is, I don't think any real tidal fishery fish is the same. What do you not like about the Potomac? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, there's, there's, there's two main things that I don't like, and I'm a huge grass fisherman. I love hydrilla, coontail, all that stuff, eelgrass, and I don't like fishing lily pads really. But so you, you, I'd go to the Potomac, you would think, oh, he's going to love the Potomac. I hate staying in one area. <laughs> I want to move around, and I cannot stand somebody being within casting distance of me. Yeah, the, the that Potomac really, drama is real. That really, yeah, you know, I'll give you a prime example. And JT Palmer, if you're watching this, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> because this year on the uh, Alpha Series on the Potomac, I had an area that I fished in the team series that we did, you know, we caught some fish in. And in practice, I went in and I caught a three-pounder immediately. So I went back in. I started there in the morning. It wasn't happening because the tide wasn't right. So I left and I came back an hour and a half later and JT was coming from this way and the spot was like right here. But he was hightailing it out of the, uh, we were in Belmont. He was hightailing it out and I had come in and I could either cut him off or I could go around him when he came through. Well, he came across and he caught one right on my waypoint. And mm. he sat there for the rest of the day for like six hours. He never moved. So I just can't stand staying in one place. You're welcome again, JT. It, it is interesting because I think that's why Potomac anglers do so well in Florida and Florida angles do so well, so well in the Potomac is it just, it, it is a camping works well there, but I don't think camping has the same, again, someone will kill me in the comments for saying this, the Delaware river, 
the James, Rappahannock, a lot of these places where you get real hard tidal movements and milk running is more efficient. I feel like you you can't camp necessarily for eight hours and have the same success. Again, I'll be killed for it in the comment section, but that's my thought. I don't I agree. Yeah. I'm not, yeah, we're not camping on the, we ain't camping we on the James. I can tell you that we're not dying. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to die like that. All right. We're not, <laughs> we're not doing that. Like I'm not waiting on nothing to swing like I am at the Potomac. Okay. I'm yeah. running to the next. I'll run 80 miles to the next swing if I got to. <laughs> like, well, that's yeah. no doubt. Well, uh, what do you guys think you have the same mindset? Like, do you have like mar marital issues on the water at all? Or do you feel like you kind of like sync up? <laughs> yeah. Jared is my, Jared calms me down. Okay. I am a hothead on the water. All right. Jared Ooh. is the, the sense of reason in the boat because look, I would, I let the wheels fall off sometimes. It's amazing that the stuff I've had by myself this year, because normally I'm, the, I'm like, don't get me wrong. Like I, I feel like I'm a pretty decent angler and like I compete pretty good, but like winning as you know, you all know is extremely hard. So I feel like winning is something to cherish when it happens. Like I've knocked on the door. We've knocked on the door for a long time. And yeah. like to finally, when you, when you bust through and get a couple wins, it feels good to validate that. And, but it's so hard, man. It's so hard to win doing this as much as we all love it and how much we compete. I mean, we fit, think about it. We show up almost every weekend doing it and it's still yeah. to win big tournaments, especially it's so hard to do. So. Speaking of like the marital dispute for sure. Like <laughs> if, if you look at our track record, we'll, we'll get into the James in a little bit. That is our like, we finally broke the curse. But if you look at us, like we don't fish Smith Mountain Lake, we don't fish Lake Anna. Like last year was the first time he's ever been to Smith Mountain Lake. That uh, still blows my mind. <laughs> they, I mean, you might have went when you were young or something, but yeah. 2018 no, was the only, time, only time I'd been there. Uh, I fished the BFL season in 2018. I went there. Lake Anna was the first time we had ever been there. When we show up to new places, we do really well because we do fish a lot of like, we kind of have the same mindset. We like to throw a lot of the same stuff. So when we show up somewhere where we don't have any experience or history, we fish really well together. We huh. break down the water well. We read the water well. Um, and we don't, because we don't have any knowledge, we're like, yeah, that, let's do that. Let's do this, you know. Yep. But when you go somewhere with history, like on the James, that's where it's always been really, really tough for us. Yeah. And, and it's just so fun you say that. And then that, how this tournament went down, like to get back to our roots is basically how we won. That's just funny. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What, what is it like then? Cause you mentioned history and, and how that affects what about the history is so frustrating. I'll, I'll start. So, <laughs> and it's funny cause we talk, I literally brought this up during the Hopewell tournament and I said, you know why we always struggle on the James is, would you have two boaters, like we're both boaters, you know, both of us own a boat, both of us fish the opens, both of us fish BFLs, like we're in, used to being in charge of the trolling motor, right? So when you have two guys who have a lot of history, who have also had some success on the water, being a boater, you get two guys that want to do their own thing. Mm -hmm. So For it's sure. really hard, like I said, because both of us have been pretty successful throughout our career. Like if we go somewhere I want to go and it's not happening, Chaz is like, I knew we shouldn't have gone here, you know, or vice versa. If we go to do somewhere that he wants to go and it's not happening, I'm like, I fucking told you we shouldn't have gone here. So you get that right there. And that's why we've always had so much trouble on the James is because we have too much knowledge. Like I have 30 years of information in my mm. room, you know, and it's, it's tough. It's really tough sometimes. Like most of the time, partners, two partners who are both boaters don't normally do as well as we do. Huh. But, you know, that it's something to think about, you know. And we don't even fish the same stuff. Like when we split, like we fish separate stuff pretty much all the time. We really don't yeah. recycle each other's water. It's just weird how, especially at home, like considering that's like our home body, the James, like we, we fish a lot alike. We know a lot of the same stuff, but like we communicate enough, like when we're competing against each other that we pretty much don't step on each other's toes. And like, we fish a different, the same, but different enough that like, I like certain stretches of the James. He likes certain stretches of the James. And sometimes like he'll stay in a section, I'll stay in a section and we'll both do really well and complete, you know, 70 miles mm -hmm. from each other. You know what I mean? So it's, 
it's just funny the how next weekend we'll go catch nine pounds in the boat together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we'll be like, oh yeah, we're on them. Let's go do it. And then like it normally just never pans out just because like he said, too much knowledge, too much. Sometimes we spread ourselves too thin. You know what I mean? Sometimes it works just like it's supposed to. And then other times, you know, they just, they move a lot, you know, everything. It's, it's hard to predict them sometimes, especially like the reason kind of how we did well in this tournament, like they did some off the wall stuff and like, we just kind of adapted it, went with it. And that's kind of like how it went down. So it's just fitting yeah. how that kind of gets our big, you know, win off we of fished, our back. It's not on history at all. Like we've never been there before. Kind of. That's Literally. Yeah. Kinda, just never. Yeah. Just, it like, let's fish it. Like we had never been here. Was that a conversation y'all had beforehand like a bar at 2 AM? Just like, Hey, we're not yeah. just going into this blind or. No. no first day we no. ran history for sure yeah first day we ran some history and it, it it somewhat paid off like we lost i broke that one off under a dock that literally might have changed things a little bit but like other than that like we had two it was a grind we had two good bites the first day and we luckily ca and they were what eight hours apart jared like Lord. they were <laughs> mm. they yeah, were yeah he caught one at check-in was at three o'clock he caught uh Three and three quarter, almost four pounder at two forty seven when we were ten minutes from the from the launch. Wow! Yeah, and I caught one a four and a half at like eight thirty, nine o'clock or something. Like I said, two completely ends of the tides, everything opposite bait, just just random, yeah. like very random. But but like off of history, and then like the second day, we were like, yeah, like maybe we shouldn't. We literally yeah. like started on one spot. We were like, "Well, let's just go this other direction." You ever been that way? And we were like, "Nah." We just started just trolling motor in that That's direction, and yeah. the rest is history. Like, literally, when you're fishing these these certain rivers, um, well, let's say non Potomac, is it a gut thing that you have for how long you're going to stay in an area, or do you have it so yeah. autism like autism spectrum like laid out? Like, we make three casts here. And then we move and then i only use a chartreuse crankbait here for one cast then i move like do you go that anal with it or not uh it depends um i would say jared is way more um he's way more like kind of planned with his approach i think like for the most part just because he has more i would say like river experience than i do so sometimes like he he kind of has those like he'll he's the one like if i'm he presses the clock back there. If I'm up on the front and I'm not like on the trolling motor good enough, if I'm not boat position, he's not right. Or if like, he's not <laughs> feeling it, like he's like, Hey, uh, we need to be six miles from here right now. Uh, so let's get on, let's get on the motor and go right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which is good because like more often than not, his judgment is right. You know, like, and not just on the James, like his, he'll tell you like, <clears throat> he, you know, like, Running I do a really middle. good job of finding them, but like when we find them together, more often than not, Jared always like kind of unlocks the little code on the the, the final day that ends up like, hey, we should go in there, and then it's like, yeah, maybe we should do that, and then we go in there and we whack them, and it's like, okay, you know, he'll tell you himself what's your I'm famous quote, Jared. I'm I'm look, I'm like a coach. I can tell you how to catch them. I just can't always catch them. <laughs> yeah, look, he. I am he real. Does it's that. so true, though. It's so true, but, like. It's crazy how it works. Like when we're in the boat together, you know, normally we're taking his boat and it, but we basically have the same boat, but I'm like, Hey, you know, look, we're running. I'll be like, Hey, you know, this is a good time to hit that little tree right there. I won't catch him off of it, but he'll catch him, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a good, like his plan with my horseshoe effect works really well in the boat. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And I got the horseshoe. It's I'm telling you, anyone watching this, knows, like, if y'all know me, y'all know I got the horseshoe. Oh and I think that you just got to ride. You just, you just can't, you can't deny the horseshoe. You just got to keep it in your back pocket and keep rolling. Yeah. But, and I definitely, I, I want to get back to Like you talked about, like you guys had a monkey on your back with this place and then you sure. got your, you, then you got your horseshoe. When, when was that moment you think? Uh, in this really tournament? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think I really didn't think we won just because there were so many. Yeah, there were so many good guys. We lost that fish the first day. Like Jacob and them had a pretty good lead. You know what I mean? Like the the people in that tournament. Like, granted, it you know the the we should have had a higher turnout. It was just kind of you know we'll sad the, the conflict on the on the BFL. But it is what it is. But like the people that were there, like those were like a lot of respected river hammers there that like that have taken thousands of dollars for me 
personally over the years. I know probably much more from Jared. So um, I'm taking some of theirs though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pay the dues though. But it, I mean, it, it like it was. We didn't think we won, but like the second day was very kind of emotional roller coaster and just kept things just you know how when things are just going your way man yeah. they just keep going and going like there there are so many fish that should have came off or like yeah. you're just like you pull up there and you're like you ever fished here no nah, you ever fished here bam four and a half hey. pounds. Like, oh, okay <laughs> like you know yeah. was, uh, we had a couple things go that it, it just and then but we also like i tried to like a, we were talking about before we got on here you know every tournament we have the winning fish on and at like one o'clock we were like, Hey, we should go hit this log again. It looked, you know, it was right. There was fish on it. Pull up. He throws a crankbait on it. Hooks a three and a half pounder and it comes off. Mm. We were like, yep, there it goes again. Lost another tournament. Cause that would have gave us 18. We thought we were going to need 18 to win. So yeah. we, we were pretty, we were pretty down in the dumps. Chaz was really down in the dumps. Like, he was, he yeah. was, yeah, you know, I was, I was frustrated man. because we up to that yeah. point, it, I had been, I had really been executing the second day was like, like I could do no wrong up until that fish. But sometimes I guess that's just fishing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like that one, that one, like there was multiple fish. Jared too. You had that one in that tree that, that ended up like in hindsight, like that fish probably won it for us too. There were multiple yeah. ways we could have yeah. lost the thing because of how tight the weights were and just the way it all worked out just you know when it's your time it's your time yeah there was kind of ride the way sure. he caught a four pounder in inches of water that was wrapped up in a tree that mm. there's no I, it was so shallow that we couldn't actually get all the way up to it so i'm laying on the front deck reaching out with the by the way this net doesn't have a handle <laughs> it's just so i've been net. working with a bad net so I'm out there reaching out trying to get this fish and he's like, get the net under it. Mind you, he's got, I got a hook from his crankbait dug into my inner thigh. While this it was actually a mag draft. Yeah, it was a mag draft. And I still have a mark on my leg. It's been weeks later. I mean, it was in there. And I eventually get in the net, but that fish should have never got on, never got in the boat. And then I caught one that called up like four ounces. That went Same under man. a tree on a drop shot that should have broke off from barnacles, mm. didn't break off. And like, yeah, it was only four ounces at the time, but we won by maybe like four to six ounces or something like that. So yeah. that fish at the end of the day was really helpful. Yep. So got, just uh, like, you know, lots of stuff that goes right, man. We got this guy. I think I've you all heard of him. Blake, Blake's mediocre bass fishing oh, says yeah, we know too Blake. much. Too much knowledge is a first class problem to have. Good job, dudes. Hey, it hurts you though. Let me tell you, it hurts you. <clears throat> and it this does. is an interesting hey, question man. from Brandon. Brandon says, Is it easy? Is it easier? Uh, is it easier to fish a Ooh. new lake without practice or a new tidal river without practice? Ooh. This is a good one. I'll, good question. We're gonna have different answers. I already know this. Chaz, you get yeah. it. Ooh. Uh for me, it's easier. If if we're asking like, me personally, if we're asking me personally, if for me, it's probably uh, going to be easier for me to fish a tidal river uh, ooh. than a lake, just because there's two more, there's more variables for me with a with a lake. Ooh, I thought he would go the other way. Chaz is a very, very, very good lake fisher. Not saying he's not a good river fisherman, but he's really good on lakes. But he grew up fishing lakes, so he's really good at seeing a pattern on a lake. And figuring that out and being able to run with it and i grew up my whole life never having a pattern because you don't you can pattern fish on the river but at the same time for example this past weekend you know i was catching them on a chatterbait well i pull up on i pulled up on a brush pile that i knew and i made two casts with a crankbait caught two fish on back-to-back -back mm -hmm. casts and never picked it up the rest of the day and only made two casts with it but that really doesn't play like into you know a pattern so for me it's much easier to fish a river than it is a lake because I'm not used to pattern fish like that. Yeah, I'm we both say, have hmm. instinctual river fishing. So we know kind of like the, the bare minimum of what, like hmm. we could get by with six rods and do 
do some damage with six six or seven rods, no problem. The lake becomes, and he knows how I am. I got way too many rods out. Like I'm the Brian Thrift. Like I have two, when, when I'm in a lake, my ADD goes crazy, and I just I gotta have everything out there laid out, ready to throw at him. But he's really good at finding them in a lake. Yeah, I, I guess much yeah. better than me. I, I I guess where I could see it is you need so much experience on a river to understand at what tide swings and what they're going to set up on. And especially I just had Alex Johnson who won uh, the Potomac and he's from the Delaware river. And he just says like, that's, that's why I can win up there is when these spots have eight foot fluctuations, unless you yeah, have 10 well. years of experience, <laughs> you can't win there. And I could definitely see that's why people that don't grow up at tide, it does look scary because absolutely the rap, the James or whatever, I could see it's really hard just to show up with no practice and figure out like, okay, on high tide, it's going to be this stick that'll have them. But on low tide, it's going to be here versus yeah. if I put both of you on a lake, you can at least a blind squirrel can find a nut there. And I don't know if my lake well, fishermen are going to kill me for that, but I feel like you can still, you know, hit yeah. sand if you fish a lake. The river though, like, like not to like segue kind of off of what he was saying though, like, <clears throat> like you know the the major part of our victory in this tournament was like the non normal tide like so we mm. have we had he'll tell you i mean there's right now we're under close coastal you know flooding advisories water is super high has been high for a long time now you know for we weeks now yeah we love it we love, I love it. it our Why friends think it? we're crazy um it's coming tide I, that yeah. is the craziest thing you've probably heard anybody ever say in here. Yeah. I have for, for the sure. last, I can't tell you, Jazz can tell you, as long yeah. as he's known me and before, my, when I do really well on the river, it's a high income and tide. It doesn't have to be a flood tide. It's just got to be incoming and high. It's not outgoing and low like most people yeah. like it. But yeah. that's what I mean, I, my time yeah. in learning is that tide. So I, I prefer it over a low tide all day. So generally yeah. speaking, what, the bass universe anything would tell you is low tide i'm going to go real high level for people that are listening the the low tide concentrates that makes it a little bit easier to find generally speaking high tide they spread out allegedly is it that you like it that they spread out and you can fish faster or is it just you feel like you figured something out for that um i just like i like i just mentioned i've just put so much time and energy into figuring them out on high tide mm. because you don't get a perfect tide every tournament right Correct. So if you go back and look at results, there's guys that always catch them on an outgoing tide, but on an incoming tide, they don't catch them. So I purposely throughout the years have put my effort into figuring them out on a high tide. And even though a low tide makes them predictable for me, a high tide, I can kind of predict and really see where they set up. So I can make more accurate casts and, and present my bait the right way on some different things. So it's just, I mean, in 2015 or 16, I can't remember the year, I spent 150 days on the Chickahominy. Jesus. You know, I have a full-time job. I work nine, you know, 7.30 to 5 in Hampton, so I was driving 45 minutes every day after work to the river to fish because, one, I was tired of getting my butt kicked. <laughs> yeah. So it'll drive you to do that. But Yeah, you know. I mean, that, there's no substitute for time on the water, man. Yeah. Agreed. There's, Agreed. There's no easy. There's no easy shortcuts to this. I don't care how many YouTube videos you watch or how many live streams you listen to. There's no substitute for going out there and actually doing it and dropping the trolling motor and putting it to work. That's Especially on tidal fisheries, because yeah. I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I watch somebody fish a duck blind, and I'm like, "Yep, they're 45 minutes too early. They'll fish it for 30 minutes, never oh. catch a fish." I'll pull up 15 minutes later and catch four or five, like on the first four or five casts. Uh, and that's where I think uh, the river rat thing is legit. You see it with smallmouth guys on the Shenandoah and Susky. It, it, I do think there's more of an advantage there than like fishing lakes. Okay, maybe a TVA, maybe, but that's something that everyone can know. It's just to know that gut feeling like this is in the tide rotation where you have to be. Same thing yeah. on the Potomac where, you know, you can get the gut thing of when a choir is going to go off versus Pohick or, or whatever. There's a good question on Instagram here that I don't want to miss, and it's running away from me here. Uh, B. Carbone, I think is that name. I'm sorry if I butchered that. Did you guys, was there any surprises from the BPT going to the James? that kind of like, oh, that's cool how they caught them. Uh, uh, for me, no. No, not really. Like, other than they screwed up a bunch of stuff that we like to fish. But that, <laughs> but neither, 
<laughs> you know, I mean, but that you just you you got to expect that. But yeah, there was definitely like areas that we've both done well off of or won plenty of money off of that had cameras on it off, you know, for oh, however, yeah. nine days or however long they beat a fishery up. I forget. But. The only the only one surprise Skeet Reese caught a four pounder inside the marina. <laughs> That was wild, yeah. like, because you know, most of the time we launch if we launch mm-hmm. on a hip ball, the marina's off limits. But yeah. where he caught it is like dry land on low tide sometimes. That's crazy. So yeah, that, legit, that, legit, that was like, wild. But other than yeah. that, I mean, yeah, I didn't think anything was really too crazy. I, I do think that there's a lot of guys that you know were live on YouTube and, and had a camera in the boat that. I'm glad they didn't slow down on some areas because they fished some absolute juice stuff and they just mm-hmm. went right over top of it with like a buzz bait or something like that. I'm like, whoo, glad y'all didn't slow down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sure. They don't get it all. They do get, they definitely expose a lot of stuff when they come to town, but they don't get it all. Yeah. And, and it's like, sometimes it's cool when they come because you get the Aaron Martin's blackbird pattern, which is like, oh, wow, that's a weird way to fish this place that no one's ever thought of. But I feel like oh this. <laughs> that's yeah. a real thing. That's a real yeah, thing. My brother thing. was on a blackbird pattern in Texas once I but had blackbirds in his live well. Yep. It was Dude, catchy. that was so freaking cool when yep. I watched that. It's like, uh, but, R. R. um, Legend. yeah. Yeah, For dude, sure. I, he would kick ass with forward facing sonar oh, right. if he was still around. I mean, dude, my God, it wouldn't even be fair. No, no. Like, no, I mean, he, he's so meticulous. He was so meticulous with everything. <clears throat> oh, dude. He no would goodness. have, he would try on a bridge every different line size out there until they figure out which one they bit bit the best it was crazy it was the, you need that devil in the detail you really do um you got it yeah. like dude, the devil is in the details and what we do like that's what separates you like i mean finding them and then like attention to details what separates you know most mm-hmm. of us really and then obviously just <laughs> execution like <laughs> yeah that's a, but- that's a big part of it especially with the forward facing sonar stuff. Cause I'm using it more now on the title of Potomac and places like that. And it's, it's hard to look when there's like 6,000 pounds of blue cats to be able to distinguish <laughs> when you don't have, you know, 200 hours. RIP and, to the Potomac and the blue cat, bro. I, Good it's, Lord. it's insane. But then you get a McCluskey on the boat. He's like, Oh yeah, that one right there. That's a two pounder. That's a Ford 250 fusion. That's a quarter. And, and that's just time with the stuff that people yeah don't want to spend yeah. with it you got to dude I, like you know like i've been using it a long time now i've got had it for four years i'm pretty good with it uh i may not be like pro but i can catch them with it for sure yeah. it, it mm-hmm. it's a definitely a huge tool like it's you know i but i was you know i did pretty well before i had it and then like having it is once you have that in the fold and you use it like with the knowledge you already have it, it definitely man in the right hands it can be deadly um it still ain't you know like it ain't cheating though for you know mm-hmm. my position on it would is actually weird like most people wouldn't think but i, I actually am not for it i'm good with the ban and all that stuff jared knows this but um, i don't have it oh my bad. yeah jared doesn't have it you know, i rarely put on my my i have like a gen 3 hgs 12 right i rarely put it on the front of my boat. <laughs> yeah, he's I true river rat. He doesn't even use electronics. Yeah, I rarely turn my electronic. When I go to the Potomac, I do, because you got to have, obviously, you know, your little dots and stuff. Well, like. yeah. Other than that, I don't even turn it on during when I fish on the Chick and the James. Dude, that's that's. I'm glad you brought that up, because that's split to me. Um, I've had a lot of people on that say they'll flip pads and shallow stuff. They'll keep, keep it on. Other people, like I was raised with high school fishing, where they said, like, you got to turn that shit off and be quiet if you're super shallow flipping, because you don't want to make the noise to spook them. I, it feels like the world's split on that. So it sounds like you definitely do old school. You turn your shit off when you're super shallow and keep it quiet. Oh, I, it's off all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I run from Osborne to the chick and cut all the flats and everything, and I I don't have it on. Hmm. I don't have my graph on. That's probably the best. I don't know. Like, I I think that's I think there's something to the clicking. I do think I've had too many people on the show that say like striper and everything else can feel that beam when you hit them with it. So I gotta think in shallow water. Oh yeah, they know they can feel that they can feel the live go. But like, but. With that being said, it's a super effective tool in li- in shallow water. Oh, yeah. Okay, I've caught a couple of fish over nine pounds in less than three foot with it, and seeing them and throw to them. So, 
you it's and that's in forward mode and I, let's not even get into what you can do with perspective and grass mm-hmm. and stuff with it you know yeah. like perspective on a 34 is almost unfair like it's it like it if you can it, see shit or i need to get lasik it might have to be that <laughs> yeah i mean we dude 34 with perspective and if you guys whoever is listening to this if you've got it you know what i'm talking about like that thing is a, is a straight weapon that's like live mega 360 like in the yeah. potomac like with ditches and troughs and grass and stuff man it's weapon that's all it's i gotta say cool. about yeah. that it's sweet. <laughs> i get why people go with a 22 inch screen though when you go perspective like for perspective mode it would just make it i, I have a 10 inch screen so yeah shit's hard to see in perspective mode for me rich, but, rich um, man problems 22 yeah. inch screen there that won't that won't be lasting long with the uh the with the, all the regulations they got well i guess you could still have the 22 but yep. you can't be over 55 well you still have to piggyback it off of it like it has to come off of another graph it's just they're a, making a math problem which is stupid but yeah, yeah. You, you can have and it's it. gotta be it can't be more than 16 and you know I, jared i was thinking about this in the super this weekend i probably am gonna have to rethink my graph mount they're probably not gonna let me keep mine up yeah, front because mine's gonna sit too high off the deck yours is a crappy mount though that's why yeah well you know yeah. Well, I, think thing, it, I think yeah. it's going to apply to the BFLs and stuff, too. I think, what, 16 inches is what I read. Yeah, but, that was for bass. Yeah, I don't we'll think what happens. anyone's yeah, going to be fishing BFLs next year, though. <laughs> yeah. it's, I it's stopped bad. that after about 2018. I cherry-picked a few in here and there, but... Nah. but it's just the payouts suck. Like, uh, Forget the whole terrible. co-angler drama. The payouts just suck. They're not what they used to be. Hey, I've had... T- no co angler drama with me though. I've had some great co anglers at the BFLs. I like. I had a. I had a the gentleman Saturday. It was awesome. His name was O'Neill Williams. He probably doesn't listen to podcasts. He's an older gentleman, but look, he had. We had a great day. O'Neill didn't catch a single fish, but we had a great time. You know, and yeah, I've had talked all day. Cool. Shared a lot of a lot of good stories. Like, and I'm you know, Jared knows me. I got. I've fished a lot of events as a co angler. And I have a special place in my heart for my going there. So, Absolutely, same. You know, um, I, you know, we weren't all able to afford bass boats and do that stuff when we were younger. That co angler gig was a, a way to get our feet in the water, Sweet. man. But, no, hundred percent. And it's the only it's 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 the home of the co anglers, what the BFL really is. But again, if the BFLs, if you're listening, Boyd, want to keep it going, it's not about limiting the boater. That's not how you do it. It's about just increasing the purse size. If you if you make it bigger, they'll come. But if you keep you know, telling they them want, they're not cutting their margin down, they just I want know. more money. <laughs> I know. We can't afford you it. Know. But we gotta pay the for the, the we gotta pay for the elite on the BCT. Oh, you got you got hey i'm really sure there's a couple guys there that they are not cheap to keep on the old tour i mean wheeler is probably demanding a high penny hey and it look yeah, he, he don't need it a man. couple he pennies a year yeah he makes a few few pennies for sure yeah yeah but that's the craziest thing looking at the bpt just how much they've won and it dropped somewhere like the top four people like have made over like three hundred thousand dollars like the last couple of years like each year they just there's yeah. so many people that but, win then, multiple but times. then look at the rest of the way down the oh, field yeah. The, the, yeah. The, the pay gap is so disparaging yeah. for some of the guys man um be curious to see what's going to happen in these next couple of years i see the npfl coming out like i feel mm-hmm. like they're going to come out strong in this whole deal i really do within with yeah. the no forward facing like you know i wish i had enough money to throw my hand my hat in the ring on that i would love to fish that trip this year That'd and be this sweet. is this is something i've applauded bass for doing which is they just switched up the lakes like again don't bitch about forward facing go sonar if you're going to the saint lawrence river in august so they have four rivers now on the schedule next year which is yeah. that's kind of how it's not that it's going to limit the guys that are good with scope because like a mccluskey will, will find them in a pool with scope but it gives the people that hate it a chance wait so till they, wait is, till you see some of them then that wait till you see that album moral vent that's oh my God. <laughs> April, that one's gonna be wild it's the only problem with that is is where the they're going out. So that's yeah, going to be not a lot of big fish, but there's going to be, there should be several 30 pound bags waiting in April there. Yeah, there will be. Yeah. I think there will be, at least, uh, you'll see a couple for sure, but the, you'll be, you're going to see a lot of 20 pound it bags. Could, it could, in all honesty, if the weather's right, if it doesn't screw up a century belt, you can see a century belt there. Like, yeah, it's you definitely could, 90 some pounds away. Yeah, 100%. 
as long yeah. as the wind doesn't. You know, the wind is the yeah. X factor down there in the album yeah. hall, but that'll really be interesting yeah. to see how that plays out. Why is that place so good? How did it become so good? It's been good for so long. Fertile. Dude, I, I, it's just I a lot of meat, a lot of... Yeah, when I was fishing back when 15, 16 years ago, I mean, I was seeing 27, 28-pound stringers, and, like, I was like, oh, this is normal. And then I started fishing the James and the Chicken. I was like, that's not normal. <laughs> that's not normal. Yeah, like, you're going yeah, you're gonna to see, gonna you're gonna see some crazy stuff. Like, wait until you see – like, I don't know if they're going to limit them the way the BPT did, like they limited them to the Chowan. Well, they're putting in like it's technically venued as the Albemarle slash Pasqua tank, which tells me that they're going to probably let these guys run around and do some crazy yep. stuff like you do at the Sabine, which means that anything that's navigable waters is in play, which means these boys could run to Florida and it's in play. All right. So like it's in the intercoastal. So the whole sound is in play. Back Bay is in play. The whole like. Everything. Uh, everything is in play. There's the you can run a hundred miles in any direction you want to go and still land on. If you really wanted to get crazy with it, I am glad you brought it back, Bay, because the the DWR has been trying to really help that place out the past couple they of have. years. They have. Oh, they have. <laughs> is it a they nightmare have. to run though? I heard it claims more props than having SB's boat. Like, is it pretty <laughs> bad with lower units? It, it's shallow like i mean it's definitely but i don't think it's like that hard like there's sand over there don't get me wrong but like you're more apt to risk run aground and okay. and beat yourself yeah. probably than you are to hit stuff now your duck blinds that's a whole other like caveat but uh whoa, sorry um but overall it's i don't think it's too crazy but you can you got to be careful down there with the wind and like if the wind's blowing in the wrong direction it can suck a lot of the water out of the bay get real shallow you can you can beat you can you can get in get in trouble but overall it's not too crazy yeah let's just throw it at people die out there on the sound every year yeah yeah and that's the thing about the wind right if they let them go they've been really good the last couple of years with like calling events and like being safe about it the tournament director has like you know chris bose is not going to put them guys out there and and and, and put them in danger for the most part miles an hour is too dangerous yeah. And, and and that's something where I was a little perplexed with the BPT. Maybe it's because of their first time there or whatever. It's like they have the option, which I honestly do think is smart, to where you could just trailer to a boat ramp, which keep the tournament going. If the weather sucks, just go figure out a boat ramp. I wish they would have done that for that tournament. It's like, go wherever you want it, if, if the wind gets bad. I think they did it just for the – they did it, I think, the limiting for the connectivity reasons and the show, right? So they can put sense. on – like now Bass, like, like if there was ever a tournament – that bass should consider a trailer trailered way in for it or like trailered launch. This would be one of them just because of like, it, like we've talked about here and I've talked about like the, the chances of the wind not blowing four days in April down here on the sound is almost none. And like he said, a 10 mile an hour, 15 mile an hour, strong wind. If guys like don't know what they're doing and they come here, like, don't get me wrong. They, they these pros run the great lakes and they do all this crazy stuff, but the way these waves stack here, when the wind blows That's like you will die is. you will die and it's yeah you can like i've heard tales of guys when the wind blows a certain direction the waves are so big and so deep in between you're looking at bottom in between the waves mm -hmm. like it's you're just yeah. yeah i mean they're almost bottoming out like and there's nothing to run in at that point and you can you can you can easily sink and die in the sound no problem like if you're if you don't know what you're doing or if you're stupid and you want to run to fish that you know you can win with like and some guys do it and more power. Yeah, they got more. They got more cojones than I do. I can tell you that. And, and the tidal chop because of just the tide flows, it's way different than the Great Lakes, where you get oh, those really deep, long, oh, yeah, undulating yeah. things. You yeah. can almost see, you can almost see those and kind of anticipate them somewhat and ride troughs and stuff. There's like if a wind blows a certain way it, down there, like you can't. Yeah. You, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you, you, there's no bass boat available that's big enough, that's long enough. Yeah. For, for, for when it blows down there. There just isn't one. You might as well be in a bay boat. We have a really cool question here. Where'd it go? Brandon, again, uh, have you gotten on a crab pattern? We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> that answers your question, uh, Brandon. Uh, can, uh, I'm going to say yes, but I, I don't know I that we can one. divulge tons. <laughs> 
it's it's crazy because i know on the upper bay when they eat a lot of crabs they get fangs it's so crazy how the fish's mouth will adjust almost yep. based on what they're eating which is just a neat little hack that they're willing to do like they're eating uh, crabs 100 percent of the time literally tied on right now oh look at that bad boy <laughs> is that a man mm. huh what was that what was that it's a crankbait i see it's a crankbait i was asking the mom <laughs> come on man Nah, shout out, hey, shout, out, hey, shout out to Cliff Pace. He makes it okay. Yeah, he does. I've got so some other questions. Is, the e that's the wreck. Hold on. That's the one that we want on the E1. Oh, yeah, that's the one right there. That's the one that we this take to this. This was in part a ten thousand dollar winning bait right here. This one yep. was in the gullet of a couple of them. Yep. How shallow is too shallow? <laughs> There's uh, no there's no such thing. So the fish that that the big one that I that was wrapped off in the tree that Derek was talking about, this thing was literally I threw it up on the bank and I, I got one half of a handle crank and the fish was on it. And like he said, I was like and I had the troll motor all the way up. Like I, I was five yards, six yards off the bank away from this. I couldn't even get to yeah, we were the, the, the troll we were motor. Was just, yeah, like yeah, the boat was literally beached before I could get to the fish. Um, so they get uh, crazy shallow. The next weekend, I had the cat tournament, and I went right there where that one was. No water, out of the water. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, in and essence, several several of the places that we caught big key fish on both days were dry land on a normal tide condition. Mm, like dry, sense. like we. Like we drive by it, like the, the one place that both of us were like, what the heck? Like we've <clears> driven by this section in, in particular, like, I don't know how many times I've driven by it and it'd be dry every land. Time and we, the river. Every time. And we yeah. drove by and we were like, huh, I think we can get up there to it. And I like came off pad and idled way up there to it, got up there to it, blow, four pounder. I was mm. like, okay, they do in fact live up here with the water when it goes up. So like, yeah, that I mean, cool, I know exactly the fish he's talking about. That was a really yeah, cool that fish. was freaking sweet. We were fishing some stuff that was like we were like, man, this is just too too shallow. But we were talking about it earlier. Like, I'd be coaching. I was like, you see that little spot right there? You're gonna throw there and catch a four pounder, and he literally threw there and caught a four pounder. And yes, it kind of gets back to an earlier conversation. How boat shy are they though? Because it sounds like you guys are almost like you know going in you know raw with it. But like, are they kind of sh like skittish when they get up that? Um, I don't think so because you're talking about moving water. So there's always constantly okay. something going on. Yeah. Or, and these fish, you know, these fish are on the move a lot. Yeah. And they like, yeah. they're not normally up there. So they're just up there doing one thing and one thing only. They're up there to eat. Okay. And you got to think we're behind them. So you got the fish here. We're here. Water okay. running in their face, you know, so we're throwing out coming to them. So they're yeah. not, they don't even know we're back there really. Mm, yeah, I I mean, it's all about your approach. It's all about how you come in on them. Like, like there are times, like Jared will tell you, like there's times where you want to fit you you fish the opposite of what you think you should, just based on eddies and stuff. Like there are times with depending on spots where instead of like it's an outgoing, I should line up with the current coming, you know, into our face and fishing into it, and that's the proper way to do it in a normal situation. There are times it's places where it eddies, so you actually have to do it opposite of what you think you would do. Yeah. Um, just to present it to the fish the way it actually is swirling down there, not the way it swirls to the surface. Like, there's a lot of different things you can do, but more often than not, yeah, like if you present it the way that the tide is flowing, the fish, it just, you know, you, you just, you don't want to be. If I go to the, the river and I see the people practice from the BFL and they're just like going the wrong way down the yeah, bank, like it. against the tide, like it's just fishing down the bank, you're like, yeah, it's going to be a long weekend for them for sure because they're not. <laughs> Do you but, listen more to the tide or wind direction? Because if the wind is blowing the wrong way, do you still just fish as if there was no wind and you fish into the tide, or do you let the wind factor in at all? That's a really good question, actually. It, that, good question. Is, that is so nope. situational. Yeah, no uh, good answer. There's no perfect answer. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, there's times where the wind is pushing you harder than yeah. the tide. So it just depends. Because my brain feels like the fish are instinctually still pointing in the direction that they should for the tide. But I was like, when I was on the wrap, like there are some sections, the wind was blown. I was like, son of a bitch. It's like it stopped it. But you yeah. go up a little bit further and it's pushing yeah, hard. Like back flowing in. Yeah. yeah. But and you that's know, like, oh, go ahead. 
no, I don't even, I was like, that's, you know, that you, you just, that's a, one of those situational things where you just like, you almost in a way it's like, you, you, you don't know if it's actually slowing the current down, but you almost feel like it is. And in which yeah. case, like I almost True. run away from places like that. Cause I feel like there's not enough current. Right. So I'm going to go mm. to a, a place where it's not back flowing like that. If I can help it, like, you know, me yeah. personally, but like, Tidal rivers are so weird when it comes to tide and wind and stuff. Like I, I had a spot that RIP to that spot. I've won so many tournaments and money off of it, but I would fish it the wrong way because of how the tree laid down. If you came over it the way you were supposed to into the tide, it didn't get down into the tree where it was. So I would throw against the tide. And when you have a crankbait and it's going against the tide, it gets down faster. Because you have the flow going on to the bill, so you're fighting it, and it gets down there, and you can reel it a whole lot slower so it doesn't move as much, and that tide is constantly pushing it down and back, and it would get to where you need to be, and that's how you used to always catch them. But yeah. things like that. Reverse engineer the bike. Comes with time and just figuring yeah. it out. And, so there's certain, and you're right. There are certain places like that where you're basically able to probe a crevice of something by backflowing mm-hmm. it. Yeah, we're giving out too much. We talked about this beforehand, Jared. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, I that, that, give it up some nuggets. That's some you know, autism that, stuff. It's that like a little nugget, but at the same time, you there's only it's a few places that I've ever yeah. found yeah. that work like that. But that just comes with hours and hours I, and hours I, of time. And you can waste a lot of time. Like if somebody I were to listen to that and say, "I'm going to go back feed it," like yeah, you can you can waste a ton of time doing that. I've it's just a situation of that. <laughs> and you also it's like you have to have a feel of the crankbait because every i think everyone has their own unique crankbait set up to where that way you can really feel that bait so you're not overworking it and getting it down and then it's really like feathering it through those places and it's weird because i feel like the chatterbait has taken which i think is fine the, like the chatterbait has taken <laughs> away so much thunder from like the crankbait and no one throws swim jigs at all and <laughs> but they're still effective they're still so freaking effective who doesn't throw a swim jig? So this well, was a huge part of our win as well. The jackhammer was a huge part of our win. Jared will Put tell you. Put that down, Chaz. Put that down. Sorry. Oh, the chatter bait? Not... That's a secret. No, it's <laughs> yeah. a trailer. Put it down. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. But, no, I mean, yeah, chatter bait square wheel, dude. Like, but not for us. Like, Jared will tell you, like, we're, like, we we love a chatter bait. We love a, any good moving bait, really. But we're both very, crank baits are find a very fond place in our, yeah. our boat. And in, in both there of our know. hearts, like we both, <laughs> we're, we're pretty fair crankers. <laughs> all, all of these boxes, crankbait, 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 all the way down. Yeah, and the crankbait like my- thing more to me than a chatterbait or a swim jig in general. It's kind of like a lipless bait where I have so many boxes of eBay lipless baits because they all make different sounds. I think that's what crankbaits do too that I just don't think chatterbaits or swim jigs can, you can't go to that nth degree of finding old models that have those different sound chambers. Yeah, the, a crankbait, dude, it, it, it sometimes like, of course, you know, there's like a lot of new baits, some, you know, things get sidelined, but like the crankbait, like pound for pound, elicit some of the best reaction strikes yeah. from the biggest fish that there is in like a in, in like one of the most subtle ways like it's just jared knows like he said two casts of the crankbait like i we like we both keep several crankbaits out on the deck at all times just for that situation that angle that time mm-hmm. because just like in the bfl like it you know a couple what it was a month or two ago i finished third in the bfl in the james like ran all the way down there, waited for the high tide, went right to a spot where I knew they should be. Co-angler jumps off a four pounder, next cast, I catch a five pounder. Like, you know, on a crankbait and like hadn't thrown it all day, kept it up there just cause I knew like there was a few situations that I may need it for. And it's not, that's just, it's just how it is. Like you, you don't always, you're not going to like, I'm not cranking all day long, but I'm cranking when, when we're hitting it, like we're making some high percentage casts, you know, and Absolutely. normally, when you throw that thing in there first, you're catching a big wall. That's normally I, how it goes down. Go, okay, here's a great question again. Mist Fit Farm, I think, said this on Instagram. Can the current move too fast for a spot? Yeah. 100%. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, it is moving too fast. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. That's exactly yeah. right. Especially, 
depending on the river you fish and some of the situations that you're in, like the James, especially like there are certain stretches of the James where you have to let the, <laughs> you've got to let the tide calm down a little bit. If you try to hit it during the rip, like you can't catch them because they're either they're they're so tight to it you could never like you could never present it the way you need to that's what i was going to say because you see this on um the shenandoah or the susquehanna like it rips so hard what can you present to them like you can't yeah you you gotta wait for it to slow down or for that tide or for that or you move in a in a in a straight you know like a shenandoah or something like that where it's always flowing you've got to move to a different downstream to a different pool behind a rock something to break that current Mm -hmm. a little bit because like in the summertime like they might be more apt to be out there and head into it but there's still certain spots they're not going to be but wintertime like no you can't yeah yeah that's Yeah. yeah you're you're, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree in the winter. If you're trying to fish stuff that's ripping like that. Um, yeah. and even then it's gotta be the right time. All right. We got back to some YouTube questions here. We got B Cal jr. What rods are you using for your crankbaits length action and your tip? You, you could go first chess. Uh, so I'm a Kistler guy. I use Kistler rods. So Kistler makes a, a line of rods called a feel and reel. It's basically a composite rod with glass and, and, and graphite. Um, and I use it just, I tailor my rod to my crankbait. So I use anywhere from a medium light for some of my flat sides to a medium for a, a dual, a lot of my DT sixes bandits and things like that. And then like, as they, you know, at square bills, I'm more of a medium heavy guy. You know, I was just a cur this weekend cranking with a 710, you know, heavy cranking rod for throwing a, uh, you know, like a 6XD, 8XD. So it just really depends. I tailor it up. But I'm a big proponent of composite um, rods, and I don't know how Jared feels about that. But um, I, I don't disagree, but I use composite rods for a long time. And I'm a Fitzgerald rods guy, so I'm with them. But uh, I use – they have – that's actually their – their most affordable series, the Versa series. They have a couple rods in there that are really good, but it's, they have a seven foot medium action rod that I use for DT four sixes and eights, all kinds of square bills, flat sides. And it yep. is phenomenal rod. And it's not a composite rod. It's just a regular graphite rod, but just the it's built. It is absolutely yep. built for a square bill for that kind of size. And then, like, you know, I do have, like, a Daiwa Tattoo Elite, a 7.4 that I throw, like, hybrid hunters and some bigger yeah. crankbaits like that, like a 4.0. I got one of those, too, that I really yeah. like. That is that is composite, that it's a chatterbait crankbait rod. But then they've got some other, like, 7.6 uh, specific for crankbait, and then I'll throw, like, a like a Little John DD, uh, a Spro Rock Crawler, something that will get down, you know, 10 to 15 feet, but that is a lot more subtle. That's mm-hmm. not that hard thumping, you know, 6XD, 5XD yeah. action. I'll go up to like a 7.6 or a 7.8, either medium heavy or heavy in some of their other lines to throw those bigger rods or those bigger crankbaits. So anything like parabolic, whether it's composite or not, if it's graphite, like I'm sure Jared will attest, like some sort of parabolic, you know, yeah. bend it. You want something that bends like throughout the rod, not like a fast action. You want a moderate. Yeah. Uh, you know, slow, moderately slow type action rod so that they can engulf and hold on to that thing. And you can, you know, when you're running troubles, you want every, uh, Absolutely. You know, every, every advantage you can in your corner. And I think a rod is a huge part of that. It's probably the most critical part of all of it really is the rod. Yeah. Go, you go moderate, with round, moderate sometimes. Do you go with round bends or triple grips? Round bend. Uh, me and Jared, this is one thing Jared and I do not ever disagree upon. Give it yeah. to him, Jared. Hayabusa NRB troubles round bid, one hundred percent. Man, they're good. I will tell you, I used triple grips for a very, very long time, and I've won a lot of money on them. And they are really good hooks. And I mean, if you're if you're catching fish that are absolutely just engulfing it, you're on a crazy crankbait bite. I, I still don't mind. Triple grips, yeah, triple grips triple probably are the better better option in there. But. If you don't got to worry about them coming off kind of deal, like you're really on them. But round bid, high boost, the NRBs, like they're they're so good, man. Yeah, <laughs> like you can't really see it, but like, yeah, that those things are ridiculous, dude. That's they, a thick hook, too, man. They're they're they it are is. So bad. It's, it's it is, but it isn't. 
Yeah. But, but at that point, dude, like you ain't got to do nothing. You just lean back on them. They're hooked. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I had a, we talked about this on a Patreon member screen stream about how important it is to match the hook, the line, the rod and stuff that if you do have a thicker hook like that, you can't have too light of a rod, too light of line, because you're not going to puncture that in there. You have to make sure all that gets matched down to the hook. Cause if you don't have the, if you have a, a super thick hook on a light setup, you're just not going to be able to put that in the mouth, vice versa. Like, but people don't usually yeah. think that way. So for like, sure. But, I, but it's deceiving though. Like that, I mean, I, I throw that square bill. Jared thinks I'm crazy. I throw that on 12. Just because I like the way it hunts. Nah, that's what my line is. All my lines yeah, 12. So, yeah, 12, like, and that, you'd be surprised, but that thing, that hook, it, mm. dude, it, it's ridiculous. And that's on a medium rod? I throw, I throw my yeah. square bill on a medium heavy, It's but it's, it's so yeah. That's important. That's important. Yeah. Okay. Well, I throw mine on a medium 12 pound line, same hooks. And you just I, you work out though probably as probably no, yeah, that, that number five like so that's the number four on there like I throw a number five a lot and a number yeah. six in that same hook on a lot of stuff and yeah medium rod medium light I throw my best my favorite cranking rod is a di uh, OG Tatula first gen medium light di Daiwa Tatula the old school Randy Howell series when he won the 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 mm. tournament on Gun Gunnersville and the classic was on that that style rod dude. Yeah. That rod is an OG, and I've caught a bazillion bass on it. And it, dude, that thing, number six, number five, even number four is like you can't. Yeah, I got a roll twos, fours. Yeah, fours. they're twos. Yeah, that we're not. Neither of us are sponsored. Like that's a non-sponsored plug. Like they just, dude, they work. We've been they're, using them. They sick. work. They work. Is that the same hook you use on your jerk baits, or do you go with a different uh, Ooh, model? That's their story. Mm, yeah, you can't. Yeah, so. No, summertime, I, I do, yes, yes, I do throw yeah. it in the summertime on my big jerk baits because it doesn't really weight it down and sink it. But yeah, in the wintertime, yeah. that's not it because it's too heavy, it'll sink it. The G on most models is this the is, deal for jerk baits. And this is something if you guys are listening, go YouTube it, like go down the rabbit hole of hooks because you'll be shocked oh. how important hooks are to certain things in your bait presentations and just converting to, hey, to mist fish. Only go down fish. the rabbit hole. If you don't got to work tomorrow, or you don't <laughs> have nothing to do tomorrow, because you will be yeah. up all night long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the jerk bait yeah. rabbit hole in of itself, and Ooh. hooks and weight, and swapping hooks, and what you can get away with, and rate of sink, and like what you're looking for. Like I, Jared will t Jared will tell you, like I'm a I'm a crazy fanatic with the jerk baits, and like in the winter time, I have three, four, five of them, and with different sink rates, because sometimes they want to a slow foot sometimes they want a true suspend sometimes they want a true like a slow sink and it all bait you can tweak that like not just necessarily with adding weight but like with changing a hook one front hook to a number like i'll like that's my sneaky tick tip on you know mega bass like i'll sometimes stick one of those number six hayabusa just on the front keep the other two crazy katsu ajay on the back and that just will nose weight it just enough to sink a little bit you know just mm -hmm. little stuff like that you can tweak with if the bat like sometimes they like it sinking and sometimes they don't um yeah. you know it's just all <laughs> tweaking and you know how that goes that's a rabbit hey, hole for you to be honest that's exactly why i started fishing with chess so jerk bay fishing is still by far the weakest part of my game and it, everybody around here knows like chaz is the jerk bait dude that dude absolutely smashes him all year on a jerk bait and i was like I need to fish with this guy. I got to figure this out. And that was pointless because he was catching them all up front. And I wasn't catching anything. <laughs> Chaz, where did that come from? I, we probably talked about this uh, -huh. uh, before, but like, was that just from your, your days fishing those reservoirs that you really ignited yeah. that? Yeah, I, I think so. I don't know what, what actually drew me to it. And this was all pre live scope. Like when I really like the love of jerk baiting really like grew with me before live scoping and when I was, you know, throwing it in areas and like, you know, fishing little points and l different things and counting it down and waiting five, 10 seconds in between pauses in the dead of winter and your lines freezing up. And like that, that just gets, man, that, that, that actually, man, gets me excited because we're not far from that now that I'm thinking about it. But, uh, I don't know. I just, I just really always love that. And I, I would love, I just love watching them, watching the line jump. Like, and you just wait and you know, like, like Jared will tell you, man, like there's some places even now, like in the wintertime, like 
it's crazy how predictable it can be. Or like you go there, make this one cast, pull it down the line, like twitch, 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 wait. I was, and then line just jumps and five pounder swims off with it. It's just crazy. It's addicting when you know where they should be and you know exactly how to present it and where to mm-hmm. put it and get it right down to them and wait. And then they eat it like that. Oof. That, that that's addictive. Yeah. <laughs> that's got my blood going. Yeah. All right, but then the, you know it. Yeah, it's it's year round though. You can do it. We're all year. way off the title yeah. river stuff. Now. We are. Yeah, we no, are. That, that that's that's what's so great about this is yeah. one of these tangents because. Yeah, we no, it's talk bassing all day, every day. Yeah, we're just yeah, we're just addicted to it, man. Dude. Yeah, because like jerk baits. Yeah, God, like it, that 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 is a whole rabbit hole. And the fact is, like, and this is the thing that scope and all these techniques really, I think as time evolves where when I get in high school, you only threw jerk baits in the wintertime. And now it's like, no, you can do that year round. And I think scope really helped with that. There's so many things like that where like you, what you were taught when you're young is just bullshit. <laughs> like it can work yeah. at different times of the year. And I do think that it's four facing center that helped us realize like a lot of the myths we had about fishing is just wrong. 100%. I mean, like they're fast as hell. Like it's, it, I was fishing Mooney the other day. It's like, I was using an ounce head to get them to react to the stupid Tamiki head. Cause they wanted it to drop. And the fact is you can't reel it fast enough. Like you would, I was yeah. always told like, you got to keep it in the water. It's like bullshit. If they want it, they will get it. It don't yeah. matter. Yeah. Have you ever fished for schooling fish? Like, yeah, yeah. Like you can't reel it fast enough. Like they will hey, take it from you. a couple of years ago. We fished a tournament in December out of rock hawk and I caught. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I remember this one. Yeah, Arnold Popper in December, like middle of December. How did you figure that out? Oh, you, you don't know me. I'd be having top water on all <laughs> every month of the year. I, I remember, Thomas, I remember thinking like, this is ridiculous. I was like, what is he doing? And then I heard like, it was like, and the thing is, is it must've been the timing. Like we, it was one of those spots like in the winter though, where like the current had slowed, like it was breaking. So it wasn't like ripping on this spot. And he literally threw it out dude it wasn't like two or three casts i don't think it he just dude, happened I to mean, pick it up boom yeah. just completely exploded on it and i looked back and i was like I, what what and then he did it again like five minutes later and caught another one on it. and i was like no one's ever gonna believe this no one's that's ever gonna believe, people it. Would believe it there's and only it was one cold month. too hey there's only one month on the chickahominy that i haven't caught a bass on top water and that is february that's the only month why yeah why? I, it's so cold. Yeah. So if I had the right conditions, I could catch one. Now this was, man, I don't know, maybe ten years ago. It, if anybody has ever done any kind of research, they know when it snows, there's zero barometric pressure, and the fish feed in the winter time when it snows. So it was January one year, and it was snowing, and I was like, I'm taking a buzz bait out, and I'm not. That's the only bait I brought with me, and I caught. A uh, five pounder and a four pounder on it. it's the only two fish I caught. Me and Kelly Pratt were the only two guys out on the river that day, and he was just couldn't believe me. And I was like, Kelly, I'm not lying to you, man. I caught, I don't, it's the only rod I got with me in the whole boat, and I caught two fish on it in yeah. middle well, of January. Yeah, they're not. They'll they they're aggressive and they'll they will eat in the winter. They'll do whatever you think. Like, don't underestimate what a bass will yeah. do. That's the high, that's the takeaway from all this. Never. They will, they will eat on dry anywhere. land. They will eat. Yeah, they will eat top water in the winter. They will do whatever. <laughs> so for all you yeah. high schoolers listening right now, just throw a popper in December is what they're telling you to do, and you will have total success. You don't um, take that advice, though. Hey, I, look, I caught them um, right at the end of November. It was like November 30th on the Pamunkey a couple years ago. I probably caught 20 or 30 that day on the popper. Is Po Monkey big enough to actually have tournaments out of? No. Like, well, no. the river itself is to a degree, but there's nowhere to launch. William's Landing with, isn't big enough. That's the same thing with the rap because I feel like the rap could hold a bigger tournament if they could figure out a boat ramp. Look, that's yeah, a I mean, sneaky good place, too. Like, Jared, have you ever been there? Huh? Have you ever been to the rap panic, Jared? No. Uh-uh. Dude, Dude, you, oh you, God, you so would like it. We got to go take a trip up there. You would like that. That's what some of the best. I remember going up there when I was a little younger. That's some of the best frog fishing I can ever remember Ooh, in my life. The frog fishing is insane. insane. Phenomenal frog. And the lily pads up there, some big ones up there on the Rappahannock too. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, really if, you're, if you want to catch a snakehead, I mean, I think there was like a yep. couple that were over like 12 pounds caught, close to 12 pounds caught this past weekend. Like it's just, it, it, no one fishes it. Yeah, we caught... So in the team series, my partner caught an 11 and a half. Chaz wasn't able to go. He just 
had his baby. So my partner called it an 11 and a half pounder and God Lord. lost to a 14 because we have a snakehead side pot. And everybody was like, oh, y'all won that? Because usually it's like eight pounds that wins. And then uh, guys we actually stay with at Kerr every year, they had an 11 and a 14 that they brought in. Jesus. <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord. Talk about giant. Hey, Talk about and they dragon, lost man. one. And they lost one bigger than the 14. He was like, it was probably 17 or 18. There was a guy kayak fishing next to him who snakehead fishes all the time. The guy was like, oh, I'm out here every week. And he was like, that's the biggest one I've ever seen, and I've caught a 15. Damn. And Dude, I was like, holy. That's awesome. are, you see, those things are up there eating too. Woo. No wonder. Like between the catfish and the snakehead, bro, the like the Potomac better you know, there's sad times ahead. <laughs> they're it, gonna it, eat it everything is, available, man. But it's crazy because the weights in the Potomac, it, it's and, and this is where I think F1s will help is at the high end. Cause this is I got in a great argument with some guys that fish the upper bay. It's like the upper bay is cool because you could catch 30 pounds, but you could also like the the last check is like nine pounds like Kerr versus the Potomac last check might be 15 pounds. It just, it's very tight weights through the thing, yeah. but it just doesn't have that higher end pop. The James and the upper Bay has where you can have, have a 25. Hard, hard to catch a fish big. over five pounds. And yeah, you know, there's just pounder, no big one. Yeah. yeah. If you catch a six pounder on the Potomac, that's like catching a 10 pounder on the yeah. J. hundred you know? percent. Yeah, I mean, like six and six to eight pounders are weighed in very regularly on the James. Like yeah, hundred percent. Ten pounders, multiple ten pounders every year weighed in on the James, yeah. and they could come from any section too because of all the redistribution. Now you can catch yeah. them sixty miles down the river. You could catch them right there at the launch at Osborne. There's ten pounders at every stretch, and you know the pit. Every every pit got multiple ten pounders in it. Like they're they're just they're everywhere. And we'll get to all the questions here because Everett dropped a go in here. What is everyone's favorite tidal river? Sorry if you answered this already. We had not answered it, but there's I only one tidal river that is in my heart, and that would be the Chickahominy. Yeah. Give me give me the James Chickahominy split for sure. Like I, I I'm very fond of the Chickahominy, but I'm also very fond of the James. So I'm just gonna consider the whole river system. Yeah, I would say it's James or Potomac is one and two, and then uh, Upper Bay, that whole thing would be number three. I, I know people are going to kill me for that, but I oh. think a river is just as strong as what the last place check is because if Curse is like, oh, I caught 30 pounds to win it, but it takes you two pounds to cash a check, bullshit. That's not a healthy fishery. So yeah. Potomac Upper just Bay. needs F1s. If, if Potomac had F1s, it would be off the damn chart because of the grass flats and stuff. But the James right now, dude. F1 could make a difference, dude. I really think the catfish would eat every damn last one of them. Like, <laughs> like, like I know I keep bringing that up, but like that is the biggest detriment to that fishery oh, is the no, blue catfish. Yeah. Like, I and agree. honestly, yeah. the James... The James is getting worse now too, like yeah. it, in the last I couple four years. Days this year, the Potomac and never caught a catfish. How? I well, yeah, that's wild. Wild. that's wild. <laughs> that's fine. Look where I finished in each tournament. <laughs> 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 oh, like because it's funny because like you said that the the, uh, the James River was ground zero for the blue cats. So the fact is, like, um, actually, guys, spoiler: I'm going to have the biologist on for the James to talk about the blue cat issue there. But it hasn't seemed like it's affected the James River as much as it has the Potomac, which is no, yeah, definitely to me. And fishing both pretty regular. I feel like I yeah. feel like the Potomac's got way more pound like yeah. per acre. Like in the, 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 I don't know what it is in the Potomac just because of maybe the flatness and the shallowness of the Potomac mm -hmm. everywhere. Like those yeah. catfish are up there just like they're bass. You, like in the grass flats, you're catching yeah. them on chowder baits, you're yeah. catching them on anything. Like, and then you move out to the hard cover for something different. Boom, catfish on that too. Like, what? But it's getting that way know. on the chick too. Like, I caught several the last couple weekends. Like, no reason a catfish should be that shallow and you're like oh that's a big end then immediately rolls and you're like what do you think it pushes the bass around uh, uh i do not I, I don't i do i do a little bit i think in the grass like certain it's situational i think in the potomac a place like that where they yeah. come to a grass bed and completely just fuck a, oh, excuse me screw a grass bed up um <laughs> i guess we're all adults here um yeah. but yeah like in that like i think it can screw them up i don't think on the james or the chick it's as, as adverse as it is up there like they're they're I'll although i will say my right. favorite tree in the river has been absolutely overran with blue cats this year so 
Um, there's at least one instance yeah. of that. Jared knows which tree I'm talking about. I've yeah. been, I've caught yeah. two, two, like near 40 pound blue cats in the BFL. I caught off that tree. So if I see blue cats better. on the scope, I leave because I have not yet, when you see a cloud of blue cats, caught a bass out of them, generally speaking. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know about a cloud. Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that's the thing that, is like on the Potomac it is you can pull up to some trees and you catch one and then you see four of them follow and once you, they're all cats like I, yeah. I don't know I mean I, I know for one time in the river this was crazy I threw up on a little reed head and it's like two feet of water I threw up on the reed head and I caught like a three pounder I threw back up there I caught like a five pound catfish <laughs> I threw back up there three cats in a row I caught like an eight pound bowfin off the same reed head on three exact casts so it's like <laughs> I think they live together sometimes. They're good creatures of opportunity. Yeah, they're like, all right, look, we're all up here for one thing. You guys get in line. We're eating. Like, (laughs) I had it. It was funny because like, um, I do cover snakeheads uh on this channel a lot because it's just that's a cult following. And I and I asked somebody about that. He's like, well, think about it. We will catch more snakehead and bass living in the same area than blue cats and bat bass because they live better together than cats. And and he says because like they're like feral hogs because catfish will come in and there'll be a thousand of them that just move through and then leave. Whereas a snakehead, you'll have one here, one there. They're, they act more like musky. And I was thinking about it. I was like, he's kind of right. When I fish pads, I'll catch a bass and a snakehead, a bass and a snakehead. But sure. when I get into Absolutely. a big when I get into a big stretch of catfish, it's like it takes forever before I get into a bass if I'm catching yeah. a couple of catfish, you know, effing yeah. up my chatterbait. They're more ambush predator like for sure. The the they're they they're very similar in that regard. The 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 snakehead and the bass that's why you'll catch them up there in the pads and stuff versus like don't you can catch a you know one up there in the pads like a catfish too sometimes you'll get one dumb one sitting up there but they don't <laughs> seem, they don't seem to you know but like like i just was so surprised at some of the grass beds where you throw in there and catch two or three four bass and then you catch four catfish and you're like what it, it, like what is going on what are y'all doing up there together like, i think what happens is they move in i that's yeah. at least in my brain because knowing how catfish move around i feel like the bass were set up there then all of a sudden like these they just kind of move into the area and, and push them out I, in my gut i really believe when those blue cats because it's never just one it's not like a flathead thing where there's like just one big one up there i just think it gets all the the, the bass pissed off like a territorial I bet nobody thing. none of your followers knew this was going to turn into a catfish discussion yeah no, no, they, <laughs> man, we haven't talked about hardly any about this win <laughs> yeah yeah for well, sure. uh, I mean, what was, uh, we could put a cherry on that. Like, did you have a moment where you thought like this was doable? Cause you were in seventh place going into day two. Yeah. When we got, when we, uh, so every time we called a good one, we'd be like, all right, you know, one down, four to go. All right. Two down, three to go. <laughs> then it was like three down, two to go. Like, okay, this, this might really, this is going to happen. And then it'd be like, all right, four down. Like we can weigh that one. If we catch one big one, we'll be good, you know. It, and it just like crazy things kept happening, but then the air get taken out of us when you lose that three and a half. Yeah. It was like, nope, typical. Like not gonna get it done. So we didn't think we won. Even sitting in the parking lot, you know, Parazic was like, "Y'all really got 17? We were like, "Our scale says sixteen, fifteen. Our scale is actually a little heavy yesterday." He was like, y'all won. Y'all got it. Like, I don't even have 15. And we're thinking, every time you weigh into the elite, you're at least a half pound pound off, right? So, <laughs> like, yeah, he's going to beat us by, like, a pound, a half a pound probably. So, there was never at any point, literally, even – There was the genuine point, surprise when we won, I yeah, think. We yeah, we were both generally – we both looked at each other like, holy crap. Like, it actually didn't hurt us, and we yeah. didn't get screwed, and we did win for once. Like, it all worked out. Yeah. Looking back then, now that both of you had some time behind a steering wheel and just to think about it, was there a fish that you'd be like, this was the one that really lynched it? Dude. There was like four of those. Like the like yeah. like they all stick out. Like there was just so many weird things, right? So like the first big one the first day, where like we were fishing these sets of trees and we were catching some fish, and then like That's they just started cool. schooling behind us and and like randomly well, on like, the end of yeah, they out in front of us, like, like up in front of us on this one group of trees like that we hadn't been to yet. Yeah, and so we rush to get over there to it, and like Jared calls it as we're sliding up to it. He's like, "We're about to double up off this tree," and surely 
and I got it all in video. I was editing the footage on this before we came on. Right. So he's like, you're about to throw up there and we're going to double up. And we literally glided over to this thing. I threw up there first cast blow catch a, a little one, like a one and three quarter or something. And he's, as I'm fighting it, he's over my shoulder and I see the chatterbait and it hits the water engage. Boom. For something like a, a big mm -hmm. one back to back cast, like on schooling fish that we never planned on fishing. Like, and they were just yeah. way more inside than we had planned on it being. And then the one later in the day that I caught with 10 minutes to go or whatever, that was uh, like the second time we fished that bank. And we just knew that Mind maybe you, this other thing, Woo Dave's just fished it five minutes before that. Mm. Yeah. So like literally coming, coming at it and leaves. And we were coming this way and he left and we just said, we ain't got much time. So we just went right behind him, caught that three and three quarter. Yeah, on a drop shot. I was just editing that that clip when I caught that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, and then the, the second day was just like good decisions. Just like I said, we yeah. just put the troll motor down and just like, oh, that looks good over there. Let's just keep doing it. And like the, yeah. the second day, we we stayed in the James. The first day, we kind of ran around and fished history. The second day, we fished all new yeah. stuff in the James, like, you know, Except upper James. We started on the first spot the same day, both days, just because – we normally catch a, a good fish there. And like you said, the second day we ran down, we ran in the chick. We ran a good ways up, halfway up the chick. Like we ran around quite a bit and caught a lot of fish, but we had a couple it's areas longer, where him yeah. and I both were catching really good fish in practice, like quality two and a half to three pounders. And they just were not there in the tournament. So that yeah, was so really all of our quality bites were on new stuff pretty much in the James for the most part. We weighed you know. one fish from the Chickahominy. It, how it, many it, people it, normally in two days in the river can say that? Well, how many yeah. people actually in a major tournament are like, I'm just going to fish new water? Like, I remember one thing that stuck out to me was Brandon Polinick when he fished the COVID year on um, Santa Cooper. It was day four. And he's like, yeah, my spot's screwed. And he just turned to the camera and was like, today I'm just going to go cruise around and find fish. And he, I don't know who the hell day four is like, yeah, fuck it. I'm yeah. just going <laughs> to go out I mean, and do you that. Made it that far, that's definitely what you got to do. That's how you win tournaments. You don't win tournaments like unless you're a, you know, you have a huge stockpile of waypoints and you fish a ton of time on water. Like, like Jared and I both kind of, we have full-time jobs. We've got families. Like it's just really hard to fish tons like we used to in our youth. Right. So like yeah. I don't have a hundred of the waypoints. No, so not really. Hard. Like, yeah, I do. Guys to do. What? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, we, like yeah. Oh, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I know, no, what I was saying is like, we, if it's a random lake and it's day four to go fish the moment, but when you guys have what 200 years of experience together on the James and you have waypoints, is it harder to then just be like big moment? We're just not going to open that book. Okay. Yeah, for sure. It, it is. It was, it was weird for us to do that. That was not like us, yeah. but like the way it felt like the, the first day, so I don't right. know. Yeah. It just, the first day, like we, we felt like we had caught, got some fish, but it just felt like our game plan the first day wasn't going to win us the second day. And like, like okay. and Jared, I don't know if you remember the text message I sent you in the morning when I woke up, like I was like, I don't know. I just woke up feeling weird that morning at like two in the morning. I literally texted him. I said, dude, I'm up. I'm ready to go. We're about to go win two ten thousand dollars You know what I mean? Like, and I just yeah. knew in my head, like we were going to just do something different. We weren't going to run the same milk run. We were just going to do, and we said it like, and that's exactly what we did. And we were like, well, what about that, you know, place out there? We run up there and catch a three something off of it. And you're like, all right, well, what about, let's just keep going. And then it's yeah. doom, 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 just fishing stuff that again, dry land or places that we didn't even consider viable fishing before. And then Absolutely. just for it all to happen during the tournament like that, like in the big event against all the people that like we respect and, you know, fish against on a regular basis. And man, it was cool. And not to mention like that event, like, I just want to say, like, that event and the way it all went down, having fished a lot of big events like Opens and stuff, like, that thing was first class, dude. There mm -hmm. was, yeah, it was like, awesome. you should have been there, dude. It was, that was the coolest event, like, trailer way in. There was hundreds of people there, vendors, music. We all got our own walkout song, you know what I mean? Cool. Like, it was, yeah, it was, yeah it was cool, dude. It was, it was first class every, every, you know, the, the Hopewell, the city of Hopewell, like rolled out the red carpet for us anglers. And um, yeah. I can't wait for that event next yeah. year. That's it really cool. reminded me of like when I got away in at Bass Pro a few years ago during the open, it was just like that. Yeah. Like, 
it was cool, man. I, yeah. I really cool hope feeling. they'll do things like this, these one-off cool tournaments like this, and, and go to some different places. Um, I, I don't know, like Lake Anna maybe in the wintertime or something like I don't know. I just pulled that off the top of my head. Just like some cool different places you can have these events. You got to have yeah, good sponsors. Yeah. You got to have good support. Yeah. You know, we like shout out to – like Mueller, Mueller put up Mueller Builders put up like you know sponsored that event. There was the city of yeah. Hopewell put up mm -hmm. a, a, some. So shout out to the people that like support our industry Absolutely. and put up money for us to do those types of things. Like there's there's a lot of people that support the industry, and and that's what those event those events you know like you know how it is. I mean we're all fishing for our own entry fees, you know, and that's so we're severely limited by that. But when you get people that support the industry and put money into it, and you know we're able to guarantee paychecks like that i mean it makes it pretty sweet it man cool. like yeah yeah it was cool for sure yeah and shout out to steve camp and team for running a good event brought the jared, elite 70 touch to it he, yeah. he did and then jared you said uh you you don't want to go to lake anna anymore yeah absolutely. <laughs> hey you know though we fish technically three tournaments there because we went up and so we have this problem where we don't pre-fish like <laughs> I told we, you that we don't practice, dude. We, we do not practice. practice. We, like hate for the first that. time we ever went to Lake Anna, I was like, "Yo, we got a t team turn there in two weeks. They got a cat trail going on. Let's go fish a cat." So the first time we ever went to Lake Anna, we fished a cat trail. So like, you know, I live two and a half hours away. He lives a little bit farther away. So we drive all that way to go fish a tournament against all the lo best local hammers, knowing like, hey, we only finished a couple places out of the money. But then the Elite Series, the next two years, we get, I think we cashed the last check, 12th or 13th place, and then we got 10th place this year. So, like, I don't got no problem with Lake Anna, but I'd rather, you know, somewhere like a river. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That Look, that swim bait bite up there, though, That's a, Ooh, that place that is was fun. Cool. That was it, yeah, it, that's great. You could hit that place. I, I still advocate, like, just to get flavor. Like, a BFL there in, like, march february ish that could probably work before the boat traffic because there's a good bite on that lake for sure they'll never I get they'll know. i don't think the bfls will ever switch their schedule because they won't even like they you won't. Know, bitch about the boat ramp at gaston gaston could's big enough to hold oh a bfl size tournament which boat ramp there's multiple boat ramps that could hold it yeah I feel like. summit summit you could definitely summit, do one in Holly Grove. Mm -hmm. yeah Holly Grove would be a little tight for a BFL, but Summit would be. I, think about the region tournament. I used to fish a region tournament, you know, 100 boats, 80 boats, 100 boats. Well, I mean, seven, you know, Gaston is fishing as good as any lake in the state right now, uh, for sure. It is. It is. The spots yeah, are. It, spots are, are yeah, ridiculous. They're getting big. Which Shout is weird because that's, that's not happening at Kerr right now. Yeah, huge, huge, huge shout out, uh, huge shout out, Rick. I think the feds want to talk to you. Uh, Thank you, Rick. Dude, so, guys are, but you know what? Like, hashtag spots are ruining the lake. That is a freaking lie. Like, the spots, like, they've just changed the dynamics of the lake, but there is still a lot of big largemouth in there, and there is yeah. still a lot of, there is a lot of big spots. The, the Look people at all that, the night tournaments. Yeah, like the yeah. people that 18, messed up that 19 lake. Eighteen pounds wins every weekend of largemouth there. Well, and that's it. And so the pre yeah. you, you want to do a hashtag? It's fuck the HOA because they killed all the grass in that bitch. And if the grass was there, that place would be completely different. So her too. Bitch at Ooh. every freaking Karen there that decided to dump pesticides in that place. Because when I was a kid, the swim jay bite and frog bite at Gaston was awesome, and that's gone because of those people. So yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just uh, different now, but it's still fishing. It's still fishing lights out. It's still a fun place to yeah. fish for sure. It, yeah. it's, it's a lot different, and it's what I think they want Kerr to become, which I just don't think it, maybe it'll happen. I don't know. There's a genetic issue there, I think. There's just some weird problem where there's not enough fish. I don't know. There's not a good spawn routine. Like, you there's, give it, just give it big. So it's 2024 now? The, the, I don't the, know. The, spot, the, spots are, the spots are getting big in certain areas of that lake. There's some guys who know how to catch them. There is four- and five-pound spots already in Kerr. The Kentucky little small spots are still there, but the bigger Kusa style spots are growing. They're in certain stretches of the lake, and you give it about five or six years, and we'll check back. There's going to be some mm -hmm. really like the, the the spread. The population is going to be much more balanced, and yeah. I don't know if that would be for the better or for the worse. Because but it can't be for the worse because Kerr is not yeah. what it used to be. Having it sucks. Yeah, you know, well, it's not I what think it used it's to actually be. better than it's been the last couple of years. I mean, if you go and look at the weights, you know. Chris well, that, well, weighed in 
18, almost 19 pounds. The weekend before on the Five Alive Trail, a guy weighed in just under 20 pounds, and there was a 17 and 16 pound bag in September. But, but again, with That's the thing crazy. with Kerr, if it's 20 pounds to win, but it takes you three pounds to cash a check, does that mean it makes it good? No, so it, it took 13 pounds to cash a check. Okay, that's but that's like good. it's like the F student getting a D. Like you're happy yeah. your kid got a better grade, but he's still failing. I, I don't. But know. it is I, September. I just, it is September too. Is so true. like I had that's I true. had twenty I had twenty something in the spring alpha. So like they're there. You know what I mean? It just um it just kind of depends. Yeah. Kerr is just not. But we expect Kerr to be like Kerr of the '90s and the early 2000s when it was at 302, 303, 304. And you could just go blast him in the bushes and have oh, this fun yeah. turn in your life. And it's just not like that anymore. Big yeah. DTV yeah. actually came in second place overall for the half co-angler the division. Fish. And so he said half the big fish weighed in at Kerr were spots, yeah. 100%. And yeah. so after talking to the Army Corps of Engineers and stuff, guys, go look at that episode, really cool history of Kerr. If they truly wanted to fix the lake, what they need to do is draw it down about six feet for two to three years, period. And let, and the let all the bit. crap grow yeah. and then fill it back. And then that place would be popping again. But they you won't have do all it. the bait fish up there yep. and all the vegetation. Well, they're so, just they're, they're never going to do that just because oh, no. they're they're not going to allow the, the 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 water to, to flow. You know, they, they're just yeah. too many, too many, too much real estate sitting on Lake Gaston with way too many, you know, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate yeah. at risk of getting flooded they're not going to let none of that happen <laughs> and that's that's the other thing too is because of what kerr is water control it will never i think this will be my hot take that everyone can get me for it'll never be as good as what gaston could be because gas the purse the, yeah. the the reason gaston exists is not the same reason kerr exists which which is sad because if kerr got super good it would never get the love kerr does which is why i'm pissed at kerr well, it's because it's the biggest lake all the tournaments go there whether it sucks or not which I don't think it how it should be. You should fish a good it's lake. It's just not as good as it used to be because again, yeah. back to the grass and all those types of things. But like in its heyday, I mean, everyone that knows yeah. Kerr, like it used to be just any point in the lake, pull up there with whatever you wanted to throw, catch three and four pounders. Like it was, it used to be just mm -hmm. ridiculous. And they're still there. Like in the alpha this year, like you got to see kind of what was up, what the, what lives in the lake. Because I mean, Jared yeah. will tell you, dude, I mean, everybody and their brother right. caught cracked them like mm -hmm. so Dude. many two and three and four pounders up shallow so like the lakes got them it's just the water level the way they keep the water mm -hmm. level now they never let the water level stay up anymore they used to let the water stay in the bushes and you could have a good spring they used to keep it up and they didn't suck it right back down now if the water gets up to 302 303 they're sucking it back down to 299 in a day or two just because mm -hmm. they don't want to i don't know what the why they don't well, do that anymore, but it, it definitely hurts the fishing. That yeah. live scoop hasn't really showed us what Kerr has. I really thought the last couple of years that man, somebody who's gonna who's gonna finally learn it, like Tyler Trent and stuff like that, get out there and just don't get me wrong, he's whooped everybody's butt the last few years. But I thought, you know, there's gotta be a bunch of four to six pounders sitting in twenty to thirty, forty feet of water. But it's, somebody just hasn't figured it out well, yet. And, and that's my yeah, hot take. Nobody then, is cracked the code. Well, I think that's because there's no, again, my hot take blue here. Blueback like, herring, though, too, is there another reason? I think blueback should make it make. better, but I still think it's like there are six pounders in there. There are big fish, but there's 100%. not enough of them. And that's the issue with that place because we've had scope and scope has shown some places to be better now. But yeah. it hasn't shown Kerr. And I think that's just because, like we've all said, the water level is crap there. They haven't taken good care of it. And even though there are bigger fish now, there's just not enough of them to where you're going to see this insane pop down the leaderboard. And they need yeah. to stock it. Like, I they, mean, there, they yeah, there was something. essentially like, a, I don't know if there's if it's studied or not, but there was definitely like some sort of large lmb virus or yeah, something yeah. that hit there that was. hit the lake. Like, it, yeah. it just it just died off. Like, it used to be better. And now it's cyclical. It's like the Suffolk lakes where I'm around the house. Like anyone will tell you the Suffolk lakes used to be trash. It used to take 15 yeah. or 16 pounds. And you're like, that's good. And now if you have 15 or 16 pounds, you're like, why are you even standing here in line? Go mm -hmm. throw the things back. That's a waste of your time. Like, you know, it just, so it, I think like I think lakes are cyclical. Yeah. It's going to come back and it's going to, and I think the spots now. are going to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I, get, many I more two to three pounders now than there used to be a yeah. few years ago. I mean, it is better, but again, guys, um, it just hasn't been managed well. The lake hasn't been managed well. It's it's, it's not I, it's not a lake. I can tell you that. It, no. I mean, yeah. Again, 
that's something <laughs> else that's i mean I'm, and i'm also i'm the guy that says like i'm glad the ppt is going there because Same. i that think this is how it's supposed to be. I think if a lake's doing good, and I know the DWR's throwing a lot of money at it, you hype it up. The James River the same way. And I'm still pissed they went to Curry because like they haven't treated that place good. And if they actually put money into it, I will sing its praises. But those people yeah. there just don't have, I don't know. It's just it's problem, a weird thing, dude. It's really weird. And I'm glad, like you said, they're going to, um, they're going to Smith Mountain Lake. But this year wasn't as good as the last couple years of Smith Mountain Lake. So, you know, they always plan several years in advance. Mm -hmm. So the numbers in the James and the whole river system, James, Chick Chickahominy, Appomattox, everywhere, is the best it's been in a long time for numbers-wise. So when the BPT comes, it does look good because they're catching a lot of numbers. But if they would have came three years ago, oh, wait, yeah. crazy. Yeah, Dude, oh, yeah the James is not fishing nearly. Yeah. to 2022, the James was – the best tidal fishery in the country, without a doubt. There was not one tournament that took less than 20 pounds of wind. Every big fish was over eight pounds for like four or five years. A guy won a two-day classic. Ray Hogg and his partner won a two-day classic in like 2020 with 50 pounds on the Chickahominy. Two days, 50 pounds on a tidal river in the beginning of October. That is unheard of. <clears throat> So two theories here that I want to I want to hit by you guys. Theory number one: that generation of fish died off, and we're waiting 100%. for the next generation. Yep. Option two: there was less cover back then, so there was less nope. area for them to hide. Nope. Which one do you think is more? Actually, it was the opposite. So back in like 2016, 27, the hydrilla showed up in the river like big time. So along with the F1 stocking. You got massive amounts of hydrilla where it's never been. So the lily pads all downriver is just full of hydrilla, which in turn started the huge crawfish population back then. So like you couldn't go anywhere without having crawfish in your live well. And I'm talking dozens every tournament. And like you could see them swimming in the hydrilla. I've never seen anything like it. So when you had crawdads, hydrilla, and F1s, that made for that yeah. river it was – Phenomenal. And let me tell you about the crankbait bite with a crankbait. <laughs> Dude, it was, it was, it, it was, it was like, like literally, you people were weighing almost 19 pounds and not cashing a check, and they were paying 15 places. Oh, yeah. And like, it was I, insane. Yeah. I had 20 pounds and came in 12 one time. <clears throat> I think yeah. that same tournament, I had 19 and I was in like 13th or 14th. Yeah. Like, I, like, yeah. 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 And for all of you that are like wanting to have a like, uh, like Gunnersville sprayed, realize that the hydro and the illgrass is why these plays pop. It's why the Potomac River pops off. Um, and then, and then now again, we got so coontail too. Oh my God. Yeah, coontail. Yeah. Guys, Ooh. yeah. Please don't kill the grass. If you have a yeah. nice house at Lake Gaston or a nice house anywhere at Lake Anna or whatever, mm -hmm. please don't kill the grass. It's good for the bass yeah. and everything and else. And we talk about the James yeah, River yeah. gloom and doom. It, it's not like there's still I've had the biologists on talking about they're still stocking it. It's still there. It's going to come back. It's just as it was explained to me, the stocking is so that when you have low troughs, it just doesn't go as it doesn't crash as hard. So if this is the crash, it's going to be insane when it bounces back because there's yeah. still well, a shit yeah. ton of fish there. Yeah. As soon as that size class comes back up and yeah. gets, gets more weight on it, it's going to be a good time. But um, circling back to that, yeah, I think a dirty 30 at Smith is going to happen in the next couple of years. It's getting damn close um, if you it look at the BFL weights. No, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it happened on the Jacob river. Jacob Prosnick caught it. Really? Jacob? I didn't know Jacob Prosnick caught it. Yeah, it was over 30 yeah. pounds. It was mm. like in March, he caught it up. And guess what? Caught it up in Richmond. And then, you know what I'm saying? You can catch it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can catch them anywhere. Yeah. And again. The F1 program, it worked. I mean, Lake Anna, yeah. um, Odenkirk, who stocks Lake Anna, said in, what, three to four years? Like, you'll see the F1. The F1s haven't shown up yet. The Dirty 30 that was caught at Lake Anna was not F1s. So yeah. it's going to be insane to see what the weights they're going to get like because there's so much bait in Smith and Lake Anna. Like, just yeah. an insane amount. It, it, they're going to go through what we're going through right now in the Chickahominy. So when the F1s are breeding with the northern strains, it just dilutes it, dilutes it, dilutes yep. it, dilutes it. It's and pretty interesting to think, uh, like, Virginia, you know, like, we could literally, you could you could almost weigh a dirty 30 if 
all corners of the state. Like, you know what I mean? In, in Virginia, yeah. like maybe not the Potomac. Sorry, Thomas, but like, no, you know, you're right. You know, like, but uh, everywhere else, man, like you can pretty much wait. I mean, the Albemarle, Smith Mountain, the James, Anna, not Kerr, let's be honest, but you could definitely, you know, on the right day, you could strike 25 on Kerr if you hit it right. Um, keep propping up that retarded child. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, he's been good to he me. She gave me my really? first major victory. Right I got to give her props. No, no, yeah. that's fine. Um, no, but you're right. And then, yeah, 100%. Like the stock, it is amazing to me. Like you look at the Carolinas where they have some good lakes, but they have some bad ones. But in general, like the DWR in Virginia has done a hell of a job trying to spruce up the lakes and bodies of water that it has. Um, even black, uh, black water, <laughs> back bay which that yeah. place will probably get some love when bass goes there like that place is oh, going to pop off be. too um i would be surprised just, if somebody ran to back bay you would be surprised that's a long I road be. it is you know it is but they're going out of the passive tank so it doesn't make it, it that long but they got a long idle to get there what about you know, when you have yeah, the river or whatever it is yeah you got to go river. through the canal too. you got to go through coin jock and stuff but look yeah, but once they come out of, once they come out of once they come out of the canal to coin jock dude the 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 whole yeah. thing is their oyster you can go any direction you want and you know look depending on the timing on that what the weather looks like they're going to be bed fishing dude it's going to be crazy like there's going to be sight fish caught over there behind Caroba beach and stuff people are going to be i mean it's going to be crazy i mean i'm sure you know that God forbid if anyone's listening to this, they're probably I know it's a no information rule, but somebody's gonna be over in Caroba Beach after listening to this now. I shouldn't have but that. <laughs> would that be like that would, would that be like that two hundred miles Sabine run? Like when we say long, I mean it's nothing like uh, that. Uh, no. Yeah. Well, I mean it's not that far, no, but it's but it's far. But it like right. let's say they were if they were launching out of like Edenton, you know, where most of the big tournaments go out of to go to Back Bay from Edenton, that is a crazy far. far crazy far you better you better plan and get gas for sure 100 yeah, um, you better be ca tactical with your time i'll say that <laughs> all right we got a couple more questions here guys and we're gonna call it night we got one a good one on instagram here is like would you rather have bpt or bassmaster come to your river um i'll have you guys answer first then i'll answer Ooh. Uh, or i can go first if you want to think more can i can i say a selfish answer None. No. Oh. <laughs> I'd rather be no no no. Selfishly, I'd rather BPT, and I'll tell you why. So BPT fishes for numbers, they don't fish for big fish. So BPT yeah. fishes for schools of two pounders, right? Pound and a half, two pounders. So they're not worried about catching finding that brush pile that's got one three pounder in it, four pounder in it. They're worried about the brush pile that's got ten two pounders. So I'd rather BPT come because they're not like I, I said earlier, they they fished over some really good stuff because they were trying to catch numbers and they weren't trying to pick something apart to catch a big fish. The elites, on the other hand, they're fishing for five. So they're going to find more stuff and expose more stuff like they did when the pro circuit came here and Nick LeBrun won. There were several things that they had on live throughout that week that I'm like, gosh, I can't believe they're showing this. Like this guy found that's impressive. Yeah. Well, look, and that whole stretch, that whole stretch of the river is now just just nowhere near what it was prior to that. Thanks, Nick. Good job. <laughs> I, Nick. I would say BPT for tidal water events because catchway release. I think when you're dealing with super brackish water places and you're transporting a thousand pound of fish, a lot of those fish, I just don't think are swimming back. If you're doing the Winya Bay event or something like that, like you can destroy an area. Like, so example, like the back bay thing, like if you have everyone move to back bay, that's gonna hurt back bay for, for a little bit of time if they pull a lot of fish out of there. Cause those bitches are not swimming back there to back bay. We'll um, back. But it's, it's just, that. it's just like the, cause of the saltwater intrusion though. That. You really they do go back? back, dude. Not for here, the water, I'm not going to talk about it, but they're definitely swimming from the James to the Chickahominy. That's not very brackish. It's very Absolutely. fresh water. Huh? You say, yeah, it's fresh water. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, people fish down below the Chickahominy all the time. Palatine, Grays. Like, them fish swim out of Grays and back up or down. Because, like, that's what happened in Anjamoin is it's – like Nanjimwin and uh, the Potomac Creek back in the day, there was a lot more saltwater intrusion. After um, 
I think it was Skeet Reese or whatever went out there. That place got the shit beat out of it, and it didn't recover until recently. Yeah, I know. I uh, broke my uh, jack blade in there. I landed on a barge in Nandrimoy. <laughs> Because I was determined to fish down there because I didn't want to be around competitors. Yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> I caught one bass in there, and I was like, this place is terrible. They're not joking. I caught one out of there, actually, the Toyota series. I know, but this was, like I said, six it's years funny. ago. I, oh, six I years can't. ago. Okay. So, I sat down next to him at the uh, in practice because I fished that Toyota series and I fished. I sat down the night before the tournament started with Michael and was eating next to him and he was like, "Yeah, I think I found him pretty good." <laughs> and then he blasted him all three days and I was like, "Okay." He's like, "Yeah, I'm going south." I was like, uh, "Duly noted." That's a heck of a run. That's a heck yeah. of a run too, especially when that wind blows. It is, and that that place again will get beat to shit, and then it'll go down for a while. Because again, I, I just think in. Th- if you follow that Nanjamoin theory, if a place is too salty at the mouth, it it doesn't take much to beat it out. Like a, yeah. like people don't know with Aquia, they have Wednesday or Thursday nighters there like all, all summer time. to restock that place. Yeah, so, hundred percent. Hey, that's a sketchy place running in Nanjamo though, because once you come up in there before you, because you know everybody goes into that back creek on the left where the where yep. the uh, all the trees the and shit is. are. Yeah. yeah, where the launch is. But that whole stretch before there, there's no channel there. Nope. Let me tell you, I found out. So my jack plate is broken. It is stuck up on twenty, and I am kicking mud, and and I'm like, I don't. There's nothing I can do, and it's. I'm just like, this is first time I ever been to the Potomac. That was really cool. Yeah. The um, have you ever been like Port Tobacco is that way? I beached my boat in Port Tobacco, and um, is it called Wick Wicked Coke? What the hell is it? Let me find the name of it. It's below. So is there bats in Port Tobacco? I've been look. I've looked at it. Like, can you? I assume bad, there's a few bats. There, but there can't be very much, I don't think. It's way up the back of that thing. Um, yeah, and again, it comes salt, salt water intrusion. Like, if it's like a really wet year, like, I feel like I don't know why there's more fish there. But uh, when I was yeah. in high school and college, we could run down to Port Tobacco and pass 301 and catch them. But it, it gets to the point of like, is it worth driving seven hours? To yeah. Just <laughs> to lose to somebody. Autumn. Yeah. But it, it's, and this happened to me where like you run that far to lose to someone that just fished in Mad Woman. And then it's like, what the hell was the point in this? Like, it's three hundred dollars worth yeah. of gas. I don't get back. Yeah, that was like this past weekend. We fished a little tournament, like I said, on Chickahominy, and I could have went up to the James. The water was high where Chaz and I fished, and I already know I could have blasted them. Mm-hmm. But is it really worth spending one hundred and fifty dollars worth of gas to win four or five hundred bucks? You know. It, yeah, exactly. Exactly, dude. Um, so yeah. I got that question. The answer is yes, there is. You should do it every time. <laughs> Gotta go for the gusto, people. It ain't nothing uh, but a, it ain't nothing but a run and trim up. Big D, you're gonna have the last question of the night if I can find that thing. Where did it go? It was a it was a jerk bait. It was a jerk bait question. Where is it? Do do do. Big D, drop that thing again. I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna find it. There it is. Uh, here we go. Uh, would y'all rather throw a swim jig or a jackhammer on the Potomac? I... Oh gosh, <laughs> what a tough question. God, uh, we both I throw know, both. I, I know the answer. Yeah, <laughs> we both throw both. So that's really tough. Yeah. I hate jack. I hate chatterbaits. I will. I will what? throw a swim jig until I die. I just. Yeah. I, I hate it. That sounds like blasphemy. Hey, that sounds like a man who's not caught enough giant. giant. This is this is true. But I catch too many giants on on a swim jig. Um, yeah, so do we though. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so what, what are you talking about? <laughs> hey, Chaz had a swim jig locked in his hand for the last couple of years up until this year, really. Yeah, I, I've I've gone I've gotten very intimate with the swim jig. I've got a couple of swim jig combos that are just seem to me that I, I actually figured it out up north. Believe it or not, I, I've got one swim jig combo that Jared yeah. knows what I'm talking about. That Fire. specific mm. specific one with a specific trailer, and I started catching smallmouth up north at Oneida on it, and I was like, Don't hmm, they really like this thing. They really like this thing up north, and I was like, well, maybe let me bring it back home. And I figured out how to catch them back. They eat yeah. it everywhere. Potomac. I weighed in several on the Potomac this year on it. I, I don't know how much the, the chatterbait is on the James, but it just gets retarded 
how many people on the Potomac throw it, which is probably the turnoff for me to it, is so many people. And I get and everybody, it. Everybody catches, a catches all I, of them. I know, I know. So and then, look, everyone, so you just got to have that confidence, though. Like, yes, yeah. do we know everyone throws it? But, like, when Jared and I are going to, like, no one's throwing it the way we're throwing it. No one's putting it no, in we the places it. we're putting it. Nobody's, like, like Jared we will tell you how many times he's got to – I get hung up 50 times a day. He's got to keep me off the brink of blowing my top every time. I get hung up, but I know, like he, he's like he'll say it. He's like, dude, you just gotta calm down because you know, like you're gonna skip it up there, and one of these is gonna be the right ones. And every time, like you just gotta know, like you're gonna get hung up a thousand times with this thing. But if I make the right cast in the right place, mm-hmm. like there is no substitute for that thing. It gets not just bites; it gets big bites. Big bites. Big mm-hmm. bites. I could tell you, you know. some chatterbait stories. I was throwing the chatterbait on the river before anybody back in like. 14 and 15 and i threw it all day and i literally threw it all day i never set it down man it it was like they've never seen it because everybody threw spinner baits and i had that to yeah. myself for like two years it was the greatest two years of my life but what's <laughs> funny i'm telling you it was dude it was unreal I agree, but as soon man. as everybody started throwing that i learned <laughs> how to throw the swim jig it was, i took one year and i threw the swim jig all thank year. you and look I That's an addictive bite. Chaz will tell you. Chaz threw it's a swim really jig. really addictive. He threw a swim yeah. jig, but he didn't throw it as much. And he knows I am huge on a swim jig. And I did put him on the one that he's throwing, not the trailer. He figured out the trailer. But the one that he throws, I put him on. Now everybody throws it, but I was throwing yeah. it before everybody. The little yeah. schmitty. So I was throwing the little schmitty before anybody was really throwing it. And I think for big years deal. I was catching them. And I've always loved the swim jig, but the chatterbait bite is so much more fun. Yeah, and I think if you to to, to get to yeah. the question, like my thought on the question is, if you feel like you're fishing behind a shit ton of people, I feel like you will have a higher probability of success fishing behind people with a swim jig than a chatterbait. Because again, it's just I don't know. You're Damn, not wrong. You're not wrong about that. But yeah. at the same time, like there are so many places where like him and I fish, like obvious places where you're, like, but it, it's just timing when to do it when 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 you do it is just as critical as how you mm-hmm. do it and, where, and and also precision and casting like yeah. putting it where it needs to be like there are times in the, in the james or in any place where you cannot be a foot off you've got to be on the line right. you've got to make the right cast if you don't make the right cast you're not going to get bit like mm-hmm. and that's the separate separating factor between yeah. us and like your average fisherman that's going down the bank like like there are places we know in our head, like where they're supposed to be, mm-hmm. and like it's just know, no, nobody's through there. Like you can, like nobody skipped up under there. Nobody's done that, and then you'll catch one. But a big thing with the chatterbait is a trailer. Oh yeah, like dude, there. I've got five boxes over here of trailers, and they're the deep ones, and I rotate through them all all the time. And they're a lot of people throw the same exact trailer for all the same situations that the same exact cover, and it just they miss so many fish on a chatterbait because of it hmm. and different weights. So I was never through a three eights until this year. And I've got literally, I counted the other day. I got $1,300 worth of jackhammer sitting by me. Yeah. He does. His, jackhammer, his jackhammer is impressive. It, it's collecting Look, ridiculous. And I counted the other day cause I was curious. I was like $1,312. That's it. And yeah. that's probably not at retail price either. That's probably like that. At the at the hookup price that he's getting it at too. So, so like, and, you, and I'm just like, but I learned about three eighths this year, like, because there was just a couple situations. I was like, man, maybe a three eighths would work. Let me buy a couple, and then it turned to well, now I got to buy fifty. <laughs> I mean, but but you know, the proof is in the pudding. Like like, I mean, I know the very first time I remember vividly, the very first time I threw a jackhammer was in a Bassmaster Open in Florida. I won four thousand dollars on it. the very first time I ever threw one, fresh out the pack. Mm. Bought one, won forty five hundred dollars on it. I was like, okay, there's something to this, and yeah. I've probably I don't know. I mean, especially around here, around the house, man. Like not just in the river. I, <laughs> golly, that that chatter made by a lot of money. Before we fish Thou- together, and tens of thousands together. of dollars have been won yeah. on the Jack Hammer between us. More than that, probably. So it works. Yeah, it, it it definitely works. You just gotta have faith in it and just keep.
keep it in your keep it locked in and know when to throw and when to put it down. Too. Hey, That's look, I know Randy Blockett says that you don't need a jackhammer. You can throw the chatterbait elite. Look, I don't all ever I listen to, to don't listen He's to Randy. No. <laughs> He's a liar. Yeah, don't I'll listen to Randy five because five to one. So look in the BF in the BFL, good story in the BFL. Like I, I did well. I finished third. I caught a majority of my fish on a jackhammer, and the old man that was fishing behind me had never been a to the chick, and B had never thrown a jackhammer. And he, like, he is like, oh, he was like, oh, that's what them them things are. Just looks like a regular chatterbait. Well, after the first stretch of trees, and he was about fourteen fish down, and didn't ever get a bite behind me. He was like, what is that thing? It doesn't, it's, it can't be just a regular jackhammer I'm, or it can't be a regular chatterbait. And I was like, you're absolutely right. It's not a regular chatterbait. And it's no, you can't have it. <laughs> like, it, like, no, like it, it, like it is like you fish that thing around somebody like my friend, Mike, Mike knows like Mike would come down to fish Suffolk lakes with me and he would come and bring his little regular chatterbaits. He would never get a bite and I would catch 20 or 30 on a jackhammer. He'd be like, I don't get it. Like, like, Hey, I, a, I'm at the front, so I'm getting all the best opportunities. Yeah. B, I'm throwing a much better bait than what you're throwing. That's just like B, you can't. The biggest thing yeah. is confidence. Yeah, that it that too. Yeah, confidence gets you more bites than what you're throwing. Yeah, hundred percent. That, that, that's a fact. It, it really is, and not to make sure, guys. We'll, we'll uh, for everyone listening, we'll we'll definitely do like a bait show here in the fall winter time, and we can go down some rabbit holes here. Oh, uh, keep this under three hours because yeah, we'll, I, I can we'll be I can talk about a swim jig for about nine hours straight. Um, Same, you and you both. We could go down the rabbit yeah. hole big time on the um, swim jig. I would love to, to, I, to do. That. I would I would love to do that. You're um, not allowed to talk about it too much, Cherish. It, it it's it's and then we got one <laughs> comment here. Shenandoah smallmouth jack. Yeah, I mean jackhammers. Like again, I get it. I think it'll be interesting now that. The the, uh, the whatever the patent shit has been lifted. If any other company will come out with a cool bladed jig that will steal the jackhammer ever, Look, or I'll we, give y'all. I'll we, give we've y'all got them in the box. <clears throat> Ooh, so you think there is a company out there now? Interesting. We've I got a, we've got a couple that are not jackhammer equivalents, but Jared, I, I was playing. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, Jared. I was messing around with a couple of them things we got last Ooh, weekend. For Mark, monkey Mark. Them things are going to be sweet come wintertime. Yeah. You know, I'll tell y'all, they you, you, you can't get them, so I've got a handful. Yeah. They're in my box. They're not even counted in my my total. But uh, yeah, that's somebody. our generation's balsa stuff, though. Think about that. Like I Bumble collect. Me. Yeah, like I collect shit. I collect silent lipless and things like you can't buy anymore. But like that was another generation's. We're in right now, like the chatterbait stuff, to where yeah. we can collect that, models that will never be made again, which will be yeah. neat to think about. And I, I mean, I'm 10 years deep in the Chatterbait game, at least. I'm yeah, sure. I mean, like, I'm day in and day out, it. it's hard to beat the jackhammer, day in and day out. Don't get me wrong. But there are some niche baits out there that serve a purpose that may not <laughs> be the overall, like, the way you can present it. Like, might not be the overall equivalent of a jackhammer, but especially on a fishery like a Potomac where everyone's throwing them. You can definitely, yeah. you can make yeah. hay with some of the, there's a few JDM models out there that, mm-hmm. especially, you yeah. know, the, like once this patent thing comes off and, and, and some things really start hitting the U S market oh. and we don't oh, have to scour yeah. around with it real, the real hard, they're going to see a shake up. The original Phoenix chatterbaits that had the same lip. Ooh, the the Phoenix thing. vibrator. Those were the deal. I mean, they had I the same lip as d So there's also a company called Bumblebee Custom Lures. They're not uh american company and don't worry guys you can't get them <laughs> but yeah, they do oh yeah do they uh <laughs> they be catching them too but they have a very similar blade style and head connection and all that yeah, i mean there's there's quite a few jdms out there like the imakatsu makes one dia has got one Great like there's blade. definitely yeah, there's there's some other ones out there. They're just different, and they have their own. It's just the vibrations different. It's more some of them are more subtle. Some of them are you know similar, but overall, you know, like I also you know, they can call it a stealth blade too. I don't know if mm-hmm. anybody's ever heard of that. So, hey, hey, don't hey, hey, hey. the hey. mini. <laughs> Which honestly, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> D, I see your question that Jack Cameron the Doa try the uh, the mini. Uh, that will actually kill it for the smallies. I've, the mini I have bat. friends. Yeah. Oh, God. It's a badass bait, dude. 
dude. The jackhammer on any body of water in America is insane. Don't let anyone <laughs> tell you any. Don't tell it. Let anyone tell you anything. Otherwise, if you're out there listening, you could take that thing to a freaking pond on the side of the road in Florida, or in a freaking pothole lake in Nebraska. I don't care where you throw it; they'll eat it if you know what you're doing. If you throw it with the right stuff and the right trailer, and you know where to put it, it will catch them. I, I agree with him. Do not throw a swim jig. Just throw a chatterbait, please. Everyone, just only throw, throw a chatterbait. Chatter definitely. Yeah. Only throw it you know on what? straight braids. Ten <laughs> one reels. <laughs> Forget both of those. Just throw a spare weight. Oh, no, God. don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. For the Special. love of God. We've got to have something to ourselves. Chaz, <laughs> what do you got coming up for your YouTube channel? You know, I've really been slacking, man. I, I've I, I've been crazy busy at work this these last couple months, so I've really been slacking on my content. I was editing some stuff, so I'm kind of sad, right? And Jared will tell you, like, I had two major victories this year, and I I neglected to film both of them. So the 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 rivers and roads, I filmed the whole first day. Have some great footage from the first day. The second day, I was just so freaking jacked up on the way up there. I just didn't even didn't even bother wearing the camera. And of course, we win ten grand. Um, so I'm frustrated about that. So I don't like all I have, but I do have like m multiple clips of day one of me just screaming while we were running of like, we're going to win fucking $10,000. Like, so like I, in that regard, like I completely like manifested that shit. It was awesome. Like, um, but I'm glad but, because the second day stuff we fished, there's no way we could have put it out. No, yeah, even yeah, he even even then, out. if I yeah, he's right. Even if I taped it, I wouldn't be able to to put it in the video because the moment I do, like we've already there's already been talk of some of the people that seen us on some of the shit that we were talking about earlier, and like not like, good because we didn't even know a boat could get there. We're like, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank God for high water. So like, there's already that like some of the places that we that that are now in the bag are really probably already been exposed too much as it is. So the video camera thing would have been way worse. Do you think there's more secret spots in the James than like a Potomac? Yes. Because of just oh, how it fishes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. There's no secret yeah. hardly on the Potomac just because you can't get away from it, but there's so many sneaky spots on the James, like where you've got to buzz a flat to get into. Like some people are like, like, you can't even some people like they don't bother like myself included there's a lot of places on the river that i'm either afraid to go into because of the running aspect to get in it's like like the yep. potomac's super hard up there where you're at but it's it's just different like in the james like you're you're seriously worried about getting maimed and wounded everywhere you go <laughs> like look, i mean look hey, our friend Jonathan just got really hurt like uh, in a yeah. john boat almost got killed the uh this week you know we yeah, I mean, he, he it, so like, yeah, of Jonathan, oh, yeah, oh yeah, it was terrible, um, and oh, that was God, in a John dude. boat with a with yeah. a nine point nine, and it it almost killed him. So, Jesus, um, yeah, the James is not right. the James is not a place to screw around with, and like I fish it a lot, and not nearly as much as some people, and there are many, many, many places that I'm afraid to run into. Yeah. Jared will tell you, like, I, I run just a lot more places than him. He won't cut flats. We ran out of a creek. Uh, the second day, and yep. I was like, he was like, I, I'm not coming. I, I don't want to do this. Like, I'm, I feel really uncomfortable being here right now. And, I, and luckily, there was a boat that ran out right before we did. And I was like, see where that boat ran? That's exactly where I run because it's not in yeah. the channel. Because the channel's mm. got logs like this laying everywhere. Yeah. If you were Thomas, like, if you were to look back at where we were talking about, like. Mind you, got 17 pounds in the bag, $10,000 on the line, got to get out of this creek. And I'm looking across this thing, and I all I can see is nothing but deadheads, as far as you can see. 20 of them probably across this flat. And well, like it's like basically fly. saying, yeah, we're going to jump up on plane, and we're going to just run this out and just zigzag across these things. And that's what it, that's what it's like. I mean, if you come off pad. We were good. I've ran we that were good. 100 times. I knew we were good. Yeah, and again, that's where like those places play. It's just so interesting. This all comes back to that first question that was asked. Tidal water, there's such an advantage to just having the experience to be like, all right, yeah, I've I've zigzagged this hell field two hundred times, so I know where everyone else is like, nope, <laughs> not doing it. <laughs> and you just um, you, there's not a lot of like you're either it's it's we're talking about flats here, so you're they're not running channels, we're running flats. So if you come off pad, if you're even like 
like even for one second thinking you're half in half out like i don't want to do this if you come off pad you're done you're stuck it's not work you you have to stay up if you come off pad you're done so it's once you're up like you trim up and like man you know it's it, it it's a tenth ride across every one of those flats and you know if you hit something like it's either going to be no lower unit or it's going to be sitting in our lap and potentially kill one of us. You know what I mean? That's the the risk you take whenever we run down there. Mm. Um, and so I'm pretty risk averse. I try to stay away from doing that, but that hap- that reality is there. Like I smoked a floater in the two weeks before that rivers and roads, like out in the middle of the channel and out in front of Hopewell, like, like in a place where there should have never been anything at all. And I hit one doing 50 miles an hour. So like, luckily I don't think it was wedged at the bottom and it just bounced off of it. And thank God for my lower unit. But like that couple inches up higher, that could have been way worse even for me out in the middle of nowhere. So like, if you do it long enough, like, you know, like our, mm-hmm. we know a guy, Timmy, you know, he, he had his whole thing ripped off down there this year. We know every year there's people we know that lose, lose lower units and potentially get hurt on the James. And that's just, that's just what you sign up for when you fish. Yeah. It. Unfortunately, that's just part of it. You know, yeah. you try to be, yeah. you try to be safe as you can, but that's just part of it. it. It's either you don't fish those areas or you, you just risk it and you do what you have to do and you put a leash on your boat and be safe. Yeah. You know, I mean, seriously, I bought one just for that. Like, I bought one. Yeah. Like, my river partner, he's had one on his bed for like four years now. For a hundred thousand, ten thousand, it makes sense. But it's like, okay, for three grand to lose a lower unit just to put into paying for the new lower unit. Yeah. It's just like, I don't know if it's worth It's got to be really enough money to make it worth the squeeze. Look, it's for not me. about the money, it's about the hardware. Like, it's <laughs> not about the money. Okay. The money about. spends, we're, you know, we're, like, we are not financially smart if we're bass fishing. Okay? <laughs> we are out here. We are not here to be making money. We are here to be making dreams reality. <laughs> all right. That's what we're here to do. I want to win. That's I can't I'll top win. that clip. My God. I okay. want to win. I don't, yeah, I don't want to. And like Jared will tell you, like money is cool. Like I love winning money, but I want trophies and hardware and memories, core yeah. memories and winning. Like, you know what I mean? That's why we do it. Yeah. I was at a uh, field of pain fishing earlier, which is actually one of our sponsors, both of us. Um, and he was like, he, we were just talking and he was like, we talked for like almost two hours earlier. So I've been talking fishing all day. He was like, why do you fish? And I was like, to win. There's no other reason, like, because yeah. I played soccer in college. Like, I have a competitive burn inside of me that I've only ever met one other human in my life that matches that. And there's nothing in this world I want more than to win. And it, like, I lost my point one two pounds Saturday on the river, and I am still mad about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's a little 16, 8, 20 boat tournament, and I'm pissed. You know. I mean, we have the pursuit of perfection, baby. That's why we do it. Uh, you guys got to get that YouTube channel back. I would definitely follow your guys' little uh, exploits. We're, we're, we're going gonna to get it back up. I'm going to, I'm, I'm sitting here with the YouTube, the, with the, with the GoPro. Yeah, I got some good ones from this year. Anna and uh, Smith Mountain Lake. Those were good, good tournaments we had up there. Those were, those were cool. I caught my first ever smallmouth on Smith Mountain Lake and it was almost a four pounder. That was cool. Oh, there's some big yeah, ones in there for sure. Here, yeah. That Jared, cool. what do you got coming up? Uh, we got uh, not this weekend. Next weekend is the Cat Two Day Classic, so we got that going out of Route Five. And then two weeks from there, we have our teams uh, Elite Team Series Classic on Kerr. So other than that, I think I got another two day at the beginning of November for uh, the Pamunkey Division in the Cat, and uh, that's about it for the year. After that, like time to buckle down and be home and spend some time with the family. You know, I got a two and a half year old son myself. So spend some time with, with baby mama and the kids. So get my few months in of being home before we're back <laughs> at it again. And, and, and <laughs> Chaz, what do you got coming up? Man, pretty much is like, I'm not nearly what he does. I, I, we got our, we got our classic, pre, uh, you know, our, our elite 70 classic on Kerr. Looking forward to that one. I think we're going to – I've got just a weird feeling about that. I know we were just out here trashing Kerr and Bugs for the last we're few and a half hours, but I think that's going to be a good event. I think the fish are going to be set up right. 
uh, when we get there for that. I think that's going to be fun. But other yeah, than that, I I'm good October history there. So I think we're going to do all right. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do much else. Yeah. yeah. I might get a wild hair though. Now, Jared knows me. I might get a wild hair and go down south and go fish something towards the end of the year. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I always yeah. like, I like doing random stuff like going out of state and going fishing something random. So we'll see. I, I've got the itch real bad to go somewhere right now. Yeah. We'll Hopefully we'll go to have, uh, so the top three teams go to the team championship, which we were lucky enough to get to go to last year down, down on the Harris chain. But, more than likely, being in sixth place, we'll probably get asked to go. Hmm. Yeah, um, and that's Wachita so. River in North Louisiana. So we might go fish the Watch the Wachita River. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully we'll get asked because that place is a is a poop hole though <laughs> down there. But yeah, but yeah, that's a straight trash fishery, well, but that's a grinder. I think we would do Jake, really well there. Jake, crankbait, spinnerbait, and we'll be all right. Yeah, that's it, literally. And then rip our lower unit off three times. We'll bring a spare with us. We'll be good. <laughs> Guys, link in the episode description everything that we talked about. I'm going to list all their social media handles so you can go follow their exploits. If you're watching this live, don't worry, it'll be taken down so I can make sure that it's not going to get knocked by YouTube for anything we say. I check it, then I re-upload it tomorrow morning so everything's good. Uh, please give these guys a follow. If you'd like to, go check us out on Patreon because uh, next year, as you guys know, I'm starting casting for conservation. It's going to be the only thing in D.C. Maryland to supplementally stock our local bodies of water. We're looking to help supplementally stock smallmouth fisheries and also get F1s in the Potomac River. So go check that out as well. Like, subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. See y'all later. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.